Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I would like to call to order this July 10th, 2022 meeting of the Bloomington, 2023, excuse me, meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order. Thank you for everyone who's joined us here in the chambers, everybody watching online. We'll start our meeting as we always do. If you could, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, welcome and thanks to everybody for participating this evening. Our first order of business tonight, Council, is to approve an agenda. And uh, on our agenda, we've got a couple of introductory items. We've got an introduction of new employees. We're going to get an update on our Bloomington Forward uh, campaign. And then uh, a mission moment, an introduction to our racial equity action teams. Uh, consent business, Com Councilmember D'Alessandro has consent this evening, and we have six items on our consent business. We have one hearing uh, this evening, it's a public hearing, item 4.1, regarding an ordinance amending Chapter 17 and Appendix A of the City Code relating to right-of-way fees. Under organizational business, we have uh, item 5.1, which is a resolution initiating rezoning of Lindale Avenue properties from B2 to B4. Uh, for folks tuning in, item 5.2, which was a, uh, an item from Continental Ballet, uh, they were going to give us an update and uh, talk to the council regarding a grant request. They have withdrawn that piece of business. So, council, that would be one change in our agenda this evening is a withdrawal of item 5.2. And then item 5.3, we will wrap up as we do with our city council policy and issue update. Council, any questions? If not, I would move approval of the agenda as stated with the removal of item 5.2 from organizational business. Second. We have a motion and a second by Council Member Lohman to adopt tonight's agenda. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0, six, six noting that uh, Council Member Martin is not with us this evening. I think he's under the weather this evening. So. We have an agenda and we will move on to item 2.1 of that agenda. It's an introduction of new employees and I think we have a, a few of them. Diane Kirby, our Community Services Director. Good evening, Mayor and Good evening. City Council. I'm delighted to introduce two new members of the Community Services Department and we'll start with the newest member of our Community Services team. Jade Burt started on June 27th as Community Health Supervisor in the Public Health Division. There she oversees the work of the Community Resource Team. Jade brings more than 10 years of experience in community health programming and direct clinical care and is passionate about empowering others as they navigate their unique health journey. Jade holds a Master of Nursing from the University of Minnesota, as well as a Master of Education from Widener University. Jade finds this combination of nursing and education offers a holistic approach to relationship building and allows her to connect across a broad range of communities. Jade grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, in a family that benefited greatly from various public health programs. She now deeply appreciates the privilege that she has in helping others. Jade currently resides in Minneapolis and is looking forward to learning about and collaborating with our public health teams dedicated to serving the cities of Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield. Please welcome Jade Burt. Jade. Good evening, Jade, welcome. Would you like to say anything? Sure. Um, I'll just say hello and thank you so much for holding space for people to come and talk about who they are. And um, this is my first experience working in government, so uh, I'm coming in with fresh eyes and an eagerness to help people. So, yeah. Well, great. We're glad to have you on board. And uh, yes, looking forward to your pers pr your perspective with those fresh eyes. That uh, I think would be an interesting, an interesting perspective to bring, especially to our public health department. So, welcome aboard. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. All right, and then I'd like to introduce our next member of the team. It's a pleasure to introduce the city's new community outreach and engagement manager, Eric Holthouse. Eric started his employment with the city on June 20th. He comes to us with more than 10 years of experience managing engagement programs for local government and higher education, specifically around sustainability. Eric comes to us from Hennepin County, where he served as climate administrative manager, leading the department's engagement team and supporting engagement and planning for urban agriculture, electric mobility, and federal funding. Previously, Eric served for seven years as sustainability program manager for the city of, city, city of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. 
Born in Dixon, Illinois, Eric holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And he is currently working on a second master's degree in public administration from Arkansas State University. In his free time, Eric participates in a soccer league that plays in Bloomington and other parts of the metro area. And he's also an expert berry forager. He has been training us on the berries that can be found right here on the grounds of Civic Plaza. Please welcome Eric Holthouse. Good evening, Eric. Welcome. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, Pleasure to meet you, uh, Council um, and Mayor. Uh, It's a privilege to be here. Just got started. Uh, Really looking forward to serving the Bloomington community. Uh, It's been a very welcoming and positive experience so far here uh, with the city organization, serving a very talented and uh, passionate team uh, in our division, in our department, and across the city, Um, and relatively new to the Twin Cities area. And so we'll uh, gladly share their bit. (laughs) <laughs> where the berry bushes are and uh, what's edible. You saw me uh, giving, a, <laughs> giving them a glance as you came in. <laughs> there are still some ripe. There are service berries and they line the parking lot. There's about 40 of those bushes and I've been harvesting them freely but we'll also freely share. <laughs> um, it's, so it's a pleasure to be here and I've uh, worked a long time as a sustainability practitioner and um, I would say with that that engagement has always been the key to sustainability success and engagement is the key to I think anything else that a community would hope to unlock and so it's a privilege to be here, be serving the community and I look forward to working with you all and perhaps hearing more about the Twin Cities and great places to go in Bloomington. Still relatively fresh here so learning a lot and meeting a lot of people. Thank you. And thank you and I can personally attest to Eric's engagement abilities because he stopped me on the way in as I walked into the building this evening and said hello so well done with that so eric and jade welcome aboard thank you so very much for being here this evening and I look forward to having you out and about in the community and, and meeting the residents of this community as well as uh, all your co-workers here at city hall so welcome thanks do we have others that's it oh that's it very good well thank you thank you very much but now I know why you were standing up because you're next on the agenda as well. That's right. Exactly right. <laughs> Item 2.2 is an update on our Bloomington Forward program. Ms. Kirby, welcome back. Thank, Thank you, you for. Thank you, Mayor and City yes. Council. This fall, Bloomington voters will consider a half cent local option sales tax to fund $155 million in capital amenity improvements. This investment plan, called Bloomington Forward, includes construction of a community health and wellness center, renovation of the Bloomington Ice Garden, and restoration of the Nine Mile Creek Corridor. The City of Bloomington has partnered with RAP Strategies, Inc. to assist with communication of the Bloomington Forward initiative. CEO Todd Rapp and Managing Director Todd Stone are here tonight to present an overview of the activities already underway to build public awareness about the Bloomington Forward Initiative. Please welcome Todd and Todd. Thank you. Mr. Rapp, Mr. Stone, good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Thanks for having us here. Thank you for being here. Nice to see you all, council members and staff. Uh, I'm Todd Rapp. I'm the CEO of Rapp Strategies. I'm going to take just a moment and talk a little bit about why it is we're so interested in public referenda, local units of government. And I'm going to turn it over to Todd Stone, who's really doing the work as he's the prog- project manager for this uh, project. You know, it, it, we've been very fortunate that um, our firm over the years has been able to work on a variety of public issues, really interesting ones, intense public issues, and then somehow we've developed this real attraction to working with local units of government and helping them when they're putting forth a referendum for the public to decide. We've we've worked on 87 of these before today, and uh, um, large and small, um, I'm currently working with a very small school district which has exactly 570 voters. Think for a second, council members, what, what that would be like to only have that number of people that uh, you, you needed to contact and respond to. Um, what, the, what we appreciate about this is that local units of government need to provide the public information that's necessary for voters to make the best decision. Uh, state law has determined that you must put the sales tax in front of voters. The voters get an opportunity to set policy by doing this, and so it becomes incumbent and truly an ethical responsibility for the local unit of government to communicate effectively. We ask that you think about this, not as some people would call it, it's public relations or marketing. Actually, it's not. What it is, is it's, it's about c- public outreach and community engagement. How do you get a conversation going with your community so members can be as 
intelligent as they choose to be and hopefully very well informed about the ballot questions, but equally as important that you are responding to the questions that they have in a timely manner. By doing that, it often builds a level of trust that you're not going to find on very many policy issues. Um, we think that the commitment that the city makes towards this outreach and engagement strategy is directly related to their success in building public confidence in these decisions. Um, one thing I do want to point out for you is that state law is very clear about the limits of the communication that the city can pay for. And on the right side of this slide, we've showed how, how we've broken those areas down into really nine key things that the city can communicate. And when you look at the website, you'll see many of these pop out for you. Um, these are the areas that if you communicate these well, You've done your job, and you're going to have a more informed residence. So with that, I'll turn it over to Todd. He can talk about the action plan. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, we've been working with uh, city staff uh, really since March, uh, building out uh, our strat strategic plan, our communications work plan, and uh, very, various communication materials uh, leading up to the, uh, the debut of the referendum microsite, bloomingtonforward.org, which uh, debuted on June 16th. Uh, as part of our work, we have put together, we've uh, worked, uh, assembled a communications calendar through election day to guide our communications work, our material development. We developed a core messaging document that we use to provide the consistent language and uh, clarity that we want to have with all our communications uh, throughout the election season. Uh, we developed the Bloomington uh, Forward logo, working with city staff, and uh, as I said, uh, launched that microsite. Um, over the past week, I've had the chance to uh, participate in two training sessions with uh, city employees at, at the Bloomington Nice Garden as well as Creekside Community um, Center. And we talked about how employees who are working, who are engaging residents every day can kind of serve as information ambassadors. As Todd described, we want to be information focused in all the work we do in our communications and our um, community outreach. And uh, there are no better uh, there's no better way to reach more residents uh, with good information than the employees who are out there every day talking to your um, constituents. So that, uh, that was a really a fun process, and we're going to continue those conversations in the days and weeks ahead. We're working on other communications materials currently, in including a PowerPoint that's going to be available for city staff and city leaders to use when there are opportunities to engage uh, different civic groups or different community groups or neighborhood groups about the, the referendum and the projects it supports. Uh, we'll be developing other communications materials with city staff, that, uh, including public signs for buildings and things like that, again, directing residents to where they can get additional information. The city staff has already done a great job developing several informational videos about the projects and uh, the needs that they'll address. And uh, we're talking about some other ideas on video to move moving forward. Really taking a step back, big picture, what we're trying to do is start building up, accelerating our information and outreach activities in the days and weeks ahead leading up to uh, early voting. Uh, just a few things about the, the Bloomington Forward microsite. Again, it debuted just a little over three weeks ago. Um, as uh, Todd described, those nine areas of focus in terms of information we want to provide residents, you'll see that broken out on the website. Uh, everything from explaining the challenges, the plan, the cost, that's important too, and the tax impact, as well as voting information and resources, different background materials that will help guide uh, residents in getting their questions answered. We're going to have a free, we already have a frequently asked questions module set up uh, for residents to dive deeper into the details. We're going to keep updating that as we continue to get questions from residents from different uh, places uh, and we get those questions answered. We'll take those questions and answers and then put them on the microsite too so we can continue to share that information more broadly. The website's very smartphone friendly. That's important because as we continue to develop more communications materials, a lot of those are going to fe uh, feature QR codes where you can just, you know, point your smartphone right to it, click, and then you're directed directly to the microsite to get your questions answered. Uh, in those three weeks, uh, we have already attracted more than 1,150 unique visitors, and we're approaching 3,000 page views. We love to see a lot of page views, uh, more than the number of uh, unique visitors. We like that ratio to be around two and a half to three times per visit. We're seeing that so far. That tells us that residents are taking the time to not just look at one page, but they're clicking around. They're exploring the website a little bit, hopefully getting the information they need. The last thing I'll just point out is so far you'll see that 58% of uh, the searches are coming 
coming from desktops. We think that ratio is going to change over time, and people will start gravitating to their smartphone as the primary device to um, use the microsite, in part because we're going to be having a lot more communications materials directing them there. Just um, walk you through just a few th uh, areas of how we're trying to frame messaging that's focused on answering questions. Most fundamental question, why now? Why are we being asked to consider these, this proposal and these projects now? Just some of the th uh, points of emphasis. Bloomington had quite a growth spurt in uh, between 2010 and 2020. Um, and as such, services and amenities that residents need are growing and evolving. The public health building and Creekside Community Center are both over 60 years old and can no longer accommodate the current level of programming and service demands that residents have. The ice garden needs critical infrastructure work, including modernized refrigeration systems. And the Nine Mile Creek Corridor, which is a great access to nature right here in our own backyard, uh, requires re rehabilitation of riverbanks and natural habitat protections. I also want to talk about how the projects address residents' needs. Uh, Todd mentioned at the beginning, vision for the uh, future, what's, dry, what's motivating work like this, planning like this that leads to project proposals such as this. We're talking about offering a wider range of amenities and services for all residents of all ages, cultures, and economic statuses. That's why this investment plan has been put forward and with a focus on three primary projects, as you know, of course, the new Community Health and Wellness Center, Bloomington Nice Garden, and the Creek Corridor. When we talk about the plan and its benefits, we also need to talk about uh, the legislature's role as well as the tax impact. We want to explain that the legislature first played an important role in this process, reviewing the projects as proposed by the city and determining whether that met their definition of regional impact before they would authorize and allow the city to move forward with a half percent sales tax option on this November's ballot. We're referring to the tax impact itself. If we're going to describe the benefits, we need to talk about the costs. And we want to come up with different ways to describe the tax impact that residents can easily understand. We use, And you can see the different ways in which we're uh, framing the tax impact so residents consider that value-based proposition when they go to vote. Among other common uh, questions that we will see and already are getting, why a sales tax? And we'll have uh, various messaging that explains why a sales tax was the preferred option over other considerations, sharing the costs among residents and non-residents for these investments. Um, we'll explain how the, the University of Minnesota's independent study that um, uh, predict that uh, demonstrated that 60% of the sales tax would be uh, uh, collected from non-residents who purchase goods and services in the city. And most importantly, we want to make sure people have the information they need to vote to, make the, uh, to participate in this important community decision. So we have basic information up now about election dates, but we're going to, have, we're going to continue to update the microsite and other communications materials so residents know where, uh, where to vote, how to register, if they want to vote early, what their options are, if they want to wait till election day, and we'll make sure they have good information on where they go to vote on November 7th. Sorry, the clicker suddenly is not working. Well, the, there was just one slide left, and basically the focus of that slide was this. We're uh, going to continue to move forward to make sure we have a dynamic, updated uh, microsite that provides uh, all the information that, re that residents need as best we can. We'll have, uh, we're going to be exploring and identifying new opportunities for si to put city staff in front of residents at different community events and among civic groups. We'll be um, uh, trying to uh, make sure we answer, uh, position all, um, all our communications materials to address uh, uh, questions residents have. One of the things that Diane and I have talked about is making sure that we adhere to what we call a 24-hour rule, making sure if we get a question from residents that we get, a, get them a response within 24 hours, try to answer their questions. At the very least, tell them that we're working on it, and we'll get them a response as soon as possible. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And, and if you have any questions for us, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I guess the question that jumps to my mind is it, impressive looking as you've been talking. I got to the website and looked through it and, and very impressed with it. 
are there other plans for additional social media outlets? Because we, we know that a, a website is wonderful, but there are a lot of different ways that people get their information now. Yeah, we're, one of the things we're doing, and uh, Di- actually we talked about that earlier this afternoon with Diane and her team, we're going to use uh, all the city's social media platforms to promote uh, the, the microsite itself to direct people to go there uh, for, as, a, as a key information source. Also, as we develop more materials, like new videos, and you'll see some videos already being promoted, as you see more of those videos get uh, shared, we're also going to continue to direct people back to bloomingtonforward.org. Council questions of Mr. Stone, Mr. Rapp? Council Member Lohman? Just more of a statement. I had some questions for you, but I looked on the website, and there it was. There was the answer. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Impressive. Thank you. Council, anything? I do want to clarify, and, and you said it, but I want to make sure that we say it as clearly as possible. The information the city is able to provide on this is information. Yes. It is not advocacy. Absolutely. And that's one of the things we talked with all the city employees about during uh, our training sessions was that uh, when you're uh, on the clock and, you're, uh, and, uh, and you are talking on behalf of the city by providing information only, uh, not to use any city resources for advocacy of any kind, once you're off the clock and on your own time, you're welcome to uh, participate in any kind of advocacy you want. And I appreciate that distinction, and I appreciate you talking with the folks who are going to be working on this and to make sure that that stays very, very specific and very clear because, yes, this is this is an information effort. This is not an advocacy effort. Absolutely. By law. By law. Not that, yes. Well, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Rapp, thank you. Thanks for thank being here this evening. Thank you very evening. much. Yes. We will move on to item 2.3 on our agenda which is uh, one of our mission moments. We have them every now and again. Uh, some of them are recur annually, and this is one of our annually recurring mission moments. This is an introduction to our racial equity action team. And Faith Jackson is here with us this evening. And look at that, the presentation. Just like, here, just just like that. You, Mike. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, and community. Uh, both the folks in the audience and those who are tuning in um, online. Faith Jackson here, Chief Equity Inclusion Officer for the City of Bloomington. And tonight I have the pleasure with you to present uh, this presentation, which is the series, uh, the first in a series of presentations that provide an update on the work of the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. So... Oh, look at that. Thank you. <laughs> Consistent with the city's mission uh, to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community, a place where people want to be, our office envisions a vibrant, safe, and healthy place for all people in our community. And so we do that by embedding the work of equity, inclusion, and belonging, uh, those principles in both our internal and external work. So here on the screen, you see some of the ways that we do that. I won't go through and list them all, but I thought it would be important just to uh, provide a reminder for how we do that work. So we provide departments uh, with staff support in both learning and training opportunities. We implement racial equity frameworks and plans. We create tools and sort of resources and our thought partners with both folks in the internal organization. Uh, And also we partner with community to do disparity reduction work. Uh, One of the other things that our office is charged with doing is measuring the impact of the city's equity and inclusion work and reporting on progress, hence the reason why we're here today for the annual update. So the work that we engage in, clicker's moving a little faster than I want it to do, uh, as I mentioned before, is both internal and external, uh, and it's made possible by so many people, more people than we can mention here today. But over throughout this series of presentations, we're going to highlight three key groups. We're going to talk about our internal work, which is guided by the Racial Equity Business Plan and supported by our Racial Equity Action Teams and our employee resource groups. And then we're also going to talk about the work of the Racial Equity Strategic Plan and our disparity reduction work, which is guided by the Racial Equity Strategic Plan and supported by both community partners and residents. And so although there's many people who make this work possible, we're going to focus in on those groups over the course of the next several weeks. So tonight you're going to hear from our Racial Equity Action Teams. Uh, On July 24th, you're going to hear from myself and Padal Yang, and we're going to provide a comprehensive overview of the work that we've been doing in the office. And then on August 14th, you're going to hear from the employee resource groups. And these uh, presentations will make up that sort of comprehensive update on the work that we're doing. 
And so with that, I am going to invite Padal Yang here, the Equity Inclusion Program Specialist for the city, to the podium. And she's going to introduce the work of the Racial Equity Action Teams. Uh, and so with that, Padal, come on up and we'll get started. Oh, one other note. Typically in the past, we've had the REIT sort of like go through their presentation and we ask that you hold questions to the end. Don't worry about doing that this year. Feel free to sort of ask questions as we go along. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good evening. Good. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Thank you for having me here tonight. Again, as Faith mentioned, my first name is Padal, last name is Yang, and I'm the Equity and Inclusion Program Specialist for our Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And so thank you, Faith, for um, having me come up here to support with our Racial Equity Action Team's update. And so just to give an overview of our racial equity action team, or what we also call them is REIT. Um, as a, just a refresher, REITs were created back in 2020, and the sole purpose is to continue to support the city of Bloomington's mission to advance racial equity. And our REITs do this by um, continuing to uplift the mission within their departments by supporting development and implementation of the department's annual racial equity work plan and promoting the development and respect and creating a respectful and inclusive culture within their departments. Within the role of each action team, um, they create an increase of staff awareness of the city's commitment to advance racial equity. Uh, they also identify opportunities to advance racial equity in the department's programs, policies, and practices because they are the key experts within each of those areas and they know where the gaps may be. Uh, they support development and implementation again within their department through their annual racial equity work plan and specific key items on which the action teams will be responsible for. And then they also serve serve as a sounding board for racial equity related workplace issues within the department as well. And so as Faith mentioned, uh, tonight we're going to have key staff from each of the racial equity action teams within their departments come up and present about who they are and key highlights. And then there are some racial equity action team champions who weren't able to make it tonight. And so I'll be presenting on behalf of them as well. And with that, we have our really first one to come up here to present um, about our administration, Racial Equity Action Team. Yeah, Mayor and City Council, it's nice to address you from, uh, from this side of the podium for once. Um, so I'll be speaking uh, briefly about the work of the Administration Racial Equity Team, or a treat as we branded ourselves. Because um, it was such a treat to get together with uh, this list of fine folks that you see up there from uh, the City Manager's Office, City Clerk, Human Resources, and the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Um, so our fearless leader, Assistant City Manager Mike Sable, we were charged to uh, come together, uh, assemble as a group, create something in a short period of time, and then disband, which was kind of a new concept for some of us. We said, wait, we're not going to keep meeting and keep working on these things? No, he said, we're going to make, we're going to, uh, we started meeting early 2022, and we're charged with within a year or so, we're going to put out um, a couple of policies or products and, uh, and put those into effect. Uh, so our group uh, center, circled around two efforts, uh, community involvement time policy, which I'll come back to a little bit more, and uh, enhanced translation services, um, primarily centered around, uh, let me stick here, primarily centered around uh, improving uh, customer service um, at, the, at the city clerk's counter um, to enhance uh, basically to enhance uh, the translation services that could be provided to residents and customers there. Um, so on that effort, uh, we've begun using uh, the Propio One app, uh, which allows for uh, the, it began in the city clerk's office, but also the police department is gonna help pilot um, this live video translation service, um, which just really steps up uh, you know, the, the ability to serve our, our customers and residents in that way that need live translation, whether they're filling out a passport app speaking with an officer, um, and so forth. Um, another effort that our team uh, put together was the community involvement time policy. Um, it's a little bit of a wonky name, but basically what that is, it allows, uh, it, al it allows, uh, or it creates for community engagement opportunities for uh, city employees that benefit the community as a whole. Um, so that can mean a lot of different things, but basically, uh, Full-time employees can flex up to eight hours of their of their paid time per year, uh, giving that time to giving their time up to an organization such as Feep, Loaves and Fishes, uh, Bridging, Oasis, and and many many more 
Uh, the list of eligible organizations is is always growing. Um, and then, uh, and actually, our group piloted that effort by uh, going out and putting in some time at Loaves and Fishes uh, last summer, which was a, a wonderful experience. Um, and then lastly, I did want to touch on the, the paid parental leave policy, um, since it is on the screen there. That effort was actually uh, put forth by the Women's Employee Resource Group. So we're going to, that, that policy is in effect now, but um, you'll hear more about that in August, as Faith mentioned, when the uh, employee resource groups come back to give their full presentation. With that, I will turn it over to community development. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Nick Johnson in the planning division, but more importantly, the community development uh, department. We're CD REIT. Uh, we are many, as you can see. Uh, one of our uh, strengths is that we have over 20 active members in our REIT, uh, and that spans all of the div divisions within community development. So uh, one of the, the greatest points, in my opinion, uh, about implementation of the REITs over the last couple of years is it's really created a forum uh, for employees across divisions to collaborate in a whole new way. Uh, and so I think with some of the projects we uh, presented to you last year, um, and I'll be presenting to you here this year, it really is that opportunity for people to have a conversation that otherwise wouldn't be working together in their normal day-to-day -day activities. Um, we do have cool t-shirts. I should mention too, they say heartbeat of the city. Uh, I realized that I wore mine the other day and it was in the dirty clothes uh, hamper. <laughs> So that was not good planning uh, by your senior planner uh, in this instance. Um, so the way that CD REIT uh, kind of approaches our activities is we blend uh, half of our uh, activities to be more educational. Uh, so we'll watch some uh, educational films or we'll have discussions about uh, various uh, either news events or activities happening within our community and how they relate to community development work. Uh, and the other half is we really focus on subgroup projects. So last year, uh, we were working on the SAC deferment and SAC credit policy. We were piloting the racial equity uh, impact analysis as part of our, uh, that sometimes you see in your packets for decision making. Um, uh, we were working on a number of different projects. And then this year, uh, the, the sub projects that we've been focused on since we last spoke to you, um, and I would say that not all of these projects are uh, CD read projects, but there is usually CD read fingerprints on them some way or another. Uh, so not only does it allow um, uh, people in different divisions to kind of cross collaborate and cross pollinate, but it also gives project managers a good roster of people who are motivated and uh, excited to do work uh, kind of furthering these different areas. So Bloom and Bloomington Workforce Development, that's in the implementation stage, uh, 12 uh, Bloom interns were placed in its first year, which exceeded, uh, I think, a lot of people's expectations in terms of the number of, of uh, youth uh, involved, so that's great. Um, second, second one, also related to youth in Bloomington, so the, a number of CD REIT uh, members have been giving presentations at, at local schools about uh, jobs uh, or career paths in local government, specifically community development. Those are job types that not a lot of uh, youth and other people are kind of aware of when you're at that uh, age. Um, so those have been really successful and been a lot of fun for the staff who've been able to do that. The Small Business Center, something that came out of um, uh, RESP and uh, uh, other staff have been working on that. Um, they're moving ahead at a really good pace and staff in our port and throughout community development are working on that. I think they're at 60% plans and hoping to get it in construction uh, next year, uh, I believe. This fall, I'm sorry, this winter. Um, so that's pretty exciting uh, in terms of the conversion of Fire Station 3. Uh, community development staff working on a business retention policy. So sometimes businesses um, through redevelopment efforts either lose their space or uh, need to move and uh, coming up with different tools or levers to help them uh, stay in Bloomington is kind of the thought process behind that one. And then finally, a facade improvement uh, program. Um, certainly our commercial nodes around Bloomington is, uh, is uh, always an ongoing discussion and topic in terms of how to keep those fresh and uh, vital. And so hopefully that uh, program will also aid in, uh, in those efforts. So with that, um, that's happy to take any questions. But uh, And Padau is great, by the way, at supporting Reed's Faith is excellent too. But Padau always answers our questions lickety-split. So thank you.
Good to meet you in council for the finance suite team. Uh, it's made up of myself, Jan Almquist, Dana Chow, Sue Legrand is our current chair, and Leslie Rio Balbueno is our current um, project manager. Do you have t-shirts? No, we don't have okay. t-shirts. Just wondering. Just wondering. Uh, an item that came before the council um, later this or late this spring was on the tree assessment piece, and so um, we have a number of assessments that are starting the process, and you will see them this fall for those that are taking advantage of that. And so um, part of the council had asked for updates on that. So every fall when we bring the tree assessment information to you, we'll be giving you that update of where we're at on tree assessments and the impact on that. Um, also this spring, the city council approved adding two BIPOC banks to our list for um, certif certificates of deposits. We haven't been able to um, fully utilize those because when we take um, banks and put CDs into place, we have to do that by competitive bids. So um, we're waiting and watching rates at these banks. So hopefully in the near future, they will have the most competitive um, prices for us. Um, and then we've launched our new phase of the vendor diversity program. So with that, um, finance is going to be the pilot and we're looking at all the contracts we have and then seeing which one of those can be turned over into POs so that we can start tracking the purchase orders in our system to see which ones and where they're at. So once we get a clear line of what the issues are with POs and managing those, then we can move that out to other departments to make sure that we can keep stepping up our vendor diversity program. And then next week, um, Leah and myself will be heading to Boston for our municipal bond and racial equity um, gathering and looking to see how we can enhance our bond documents for racial equity issues. So there's those pieces. Um, one of the other areas that um, we're working on, we've been for the last seven months doing it around the world. Um, as in Bloomington or in um, finance, we do a Monday huddle. And this morning um, we did the continent of Europe and we've done different continents and all the staff have signed up for them. And we talk about what's going on in that continent and just learn more about the world. So just different things that we've been doing in finance. Thanks. Thank you. Council, I'm trusting if anybody has questions, do not be shy, okay? Thank you. Council members, manager, I'm Leah Hughes. Um, I will be giving the Parks and Recreation REIT update. Um, who we are, it's a combination of Ann Catry, myself, um, Jill Murphy, Jean Sannon, and Jenna Smith. Is there a trick to this? Oh, there we go. All right. And here are our accomplishments um, over the next two slides. So um, mobile recreation. Wait, this went too far. I apologize. All right. Our mobile recreation um, is free programming with no registration required. Um, it is a mobile program that rotates um, to a variety of different parks every Tuesday afternoon, and it will go for the month of June and July. This provides access to a lot of different recreation activities, um, access to education on different sports and recreation things for youth um, and it moves around so it's accessible um, and not just held in, in one area. Um, we are also implementing an Adopt-A-Park program which is opening up this month. Um, this is also open to anyone. Anyone can apply. It can be individuals, groups, um, and basically it's an application to dedicate one to two days per month for your, your household or your group to just maintain the park that you love. So it's in combination and collaboration with the park maintenance team and parks and recreation. Um, services include just community cleanups, litter pickups, beautification projects, and invasive species removals. There are opportunities within this program for more involved projects and programs that are in true collaboration or more collaboration with the park maintenance teams, um, and those will be kind of accepted um, and discussed on a, a rotating basis as they come in. 
Creekside and a number of our facilities that rent spaces are seeing um, a lot of diversification in the community members and organizations that are utilizing our facilities. One highlight is Creekside is seeing an increase in culturally specific rentals. Things such as Quinceañeras, Ramadan celebrations, and city-sponsored events are being held in these rental spaces um, for the community and through the community partners that we now have. Um, a new lottery registration system was um, implemented this year for our summer parks program. Um, this was meant to increase equity and registration process by not limiting registrations to a daytime hour. Often as a parent who has to register my child for something, it's a 5 a.m. quick start and it's like getting concert tickets, it's full by 7 a.m. So we tried to take that out of the equation and make it more accessible so people can register for these programs over a number of weeks. And then it's a random draw through the rec check registration program that um, uh, set people to the different parks that they apply to. Um, we've also established the Dakota Advisory Group. This is a partnership between Dakota People, the City of Bloomington, Bloomington Historical Society, and the Pond Dakota Heritage Society. They meet um, regularly to discuss um, different opportunities for education and events in the community um, and try to coordinate as best they can together for Pond House activities and activities in other places throughout the city. Um, we're also seeing an increase in BIPOC women-owned and LGBTQIA plus art partnerships here at the Art Center. Um, some highlights are Thread Dance, um, Elevate Performing Arts, Rhythm Street Movement, um, Alternative Motion Project, Ballroom and Latin Dance, the Concerto Dance, and a continued partnership with Chad Dick Chadwick Niles Phillips and the Avant Garde for some of our arts and parks programming that many of us have um, been uh, fortunate to witness. Um, we've also been working on translating documents through the language access program. Padau, I will admit, she is fantastic. She has done a number of trainings for the Parks and Rec team to ensure that our info desks and the people who are forward-facing with the community can provide the language services that are necessary so people can understand what the opportunities are and how they and their families can become involved. Um, we've also added demographic questions to our online registration software that allows us to collect information on participants so we have a better understanding of who's showing up, how often they're showing up, but more importantly, who we're not reaching so that way we can try to fill those gaps through our various partnerships, collaborations, and try to make sure that we keep moving the work forward. Um, and lastly, we've expanded our outreach partners um, for both Kennedy and Jefferson High School. Um, to try to make sure that um, youth know what employment opportunities are within the city of Bloomington, specifically parks and recreation. And we are making um, more trips to some of the elementary schools to, again, help parents and families in Bloomington Public Schools understand what some of the, um, the programs are um, accessible to their kids and their families throughout the community as well. Um, as far as the, the Parks and Rec, we meet monthly. Um, our conversations are varied. Sometimes they revolve around articles or happenings in the news. Sometimes people bring forth things that they've, they've um, discussed or seen within the community. And so just try to change it up every month um, in addition to using a lot of the, the, I mean, Parks and Rec has a lot of forward facing people that are in the community. So some of the things that we're seeing and hearing and doing within the community kind of drive a lot of the conversations we have. So that's it for Parks and Rec. Thank you. Council Member Don Sandro. Hey, Leah. Hi. Yeah, th thanks for this. This is great. I had uh, one quick question. If you go to the um, slide prior, um, you mentioned that you're seeing an increase in um, the diversity of room rentals and things of that nature. Do you have the ability to attribute it to something in particular? You know, is it the outreach that you're doing that in includes making people aware of those things, or is it because they can now read about it in their own language, or is it some combination? How are you tracking you know, what it is that's working mm -hmm. when you're trying to look at what, what's happening there? Councilmember D'Alessandro, thank you for the question. I think it's all of the above. So I think it's the extended efforts that we're making. I think it's the language, language access program that we have. Um, I also think it's word of mouth. When people have a great experience in a facility with a great staff who has accommodated their needs and made their event as fun and as, as it can possibly be, I think that speaks volumes. And so I think we're seeing a lot of individuals in the community being more aware because of the efforts through marketing and language access, but also through, through their friends and neighbors who are talking about the experiences that they had in our facilities and in our parks. Great, thanks. Absolutely. Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Just a very quick question or just 
uh, thank you for the adopt a park program because i know there's a ton of people within our community mm -hmm. that want to help out in their parks and um if you haven't seen it i believe it was on next door there was a thread about uh helping out at the dog off leash dog park don't want to get that wrong <laughs> so <laughs> so um and if you haven't i it, there's people interested in that and and i assume that there may be some opportunities for them to help out there as well and they were looking to do exactly that so um just want to bring that to your attention thank you so council member nelson and everyone else if you if you direct them to parks and rec we can absolutely set them up with the the documents and the information but we're we have kind of the frequent flyers and people who return year after year after year um but we have not 97 parks um, and clearly one of them is needing some tender loving care at the dog park so just please send them to parks and recreation all the information is on our website and accessible um, we do have a volunteer coordinator that helps place them in the parks that they are looking to work within um, and help them find projects that they can do as either a group or like I said a neighborhood or whatever their combination might be thank you thank you Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, um, Scott Anderson from Utilities, um, Public Works, REIT, um, consists of and has had representation from maintenance, utilities, engineering, and administration since its inception. We meet generally monthly in most instances and have been working on uh, both in 2022 and 23 work plans for um, initiatives both internal to the organization and external. And I'll talk about a couple of those, or a number of those next. Um, the work plan focuses on three main areas, recruitment um, and retention and hiring of staff, um, current staff, competency, inequity development, and addressing inequities revolving uh, around infrastructure and service delivery. So with regard to um, recruitment and hiring of staff, we've, we've implemented and expanded uh, recruiting efforts for seasonal employees and internships as well as professional level recruitment, uh, recruitment and have implemented um, kind of an apprentice or a, a pathways program in utilities um, where we've been able to um, draw a much wider um, candidate pool and, and connect them with St. Paul Technical College, which, which luckily for us has a, has a utility uh, focused program, uh, year long program that that sets applicants up ready to, to test and successfully pass state examinations to become uh, licensed utility operators. Um, in the staff equity and development areas, um, we've got current, current efforts uh, revolving our equity information lending library. That's, that's a, a library of resources available for employees to, to check out as well as our monthly experiencing equity communications that are email communications sent out to staff. To, to be consumed um, at their pace, on their time, uh, just to learn more about um, equity-related topics. And then soon to come, we're looking to implement shorter toolbox talks at the crew level, as well as uh, a little more formal lunch and learns. And then uh, regarding infrastructure and service inequities, uh, we've been looking at utility rate equity and affordably, affordability issues, working with the US Water Alliance and, and other cities on on collaborating and sharing those efforts in, in those areas as well as, well as our own, um, working on a water equ equity opportunities brief that we hope to have ready soon, um, as well as public engagement events surrounding uh, infrastructure improvements, predominantly out of engineering, um, going to going out to the community, as opposed to hosting a meeting at Public Works, going out to the uh, different communities and, and trying to meet folks in place and on site. Um, so those are, handful of of the initiatives of the public works REIT uh, for 2022 and 2023. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Quick question for you, sorry. Hi. Yes. <laughs> um, did, I know that one of the things we've been talking about for a little bit within the utility billing framework is the, uh, the question um, uh, about whether, whether or not we, um, uh, whether or not we have um, um, 
whether or not our garbage dis- our garbage units can go to every other week, whether or not our utility building, like we could do some kind of a roundup service that um, allows people to help other members, you know, um, pay off the, their bills or whatever. I know we have a lot of people in delinquency right now. Are all of those things, the kinds of things that you're looking at under that topic area? I'm just kind of curious if there's, if something specific was there or any of those types of things were part of that. Um, I can take a stab at that and Carl might want to jump in, but I know with regard to to uh, solid waste, there's there's a solid waste rate study that's that's intended to be undertaken. So to to the degree that that also explores different service delivery uh, methods um, that that may or may not be a part of that. I assume it certainly could easily be if it's not already. Um, as well as um, we're we're looking at updating our cost of service model for the water utility as well. So trying to look at at, at all those avenues. Awesome. This next piece, I'm really excited to announce that we have an official fire REIT, a uh, fire racial equity um, action team. Yay! Uh, and so now we can officially say we have 10 departments that are REITs. And with that, we wanted to introduce um, Leon Chambers III to just come up and talk a little bit about him, uh, himself and the excitement for the fire REIT and what he envisions. Oh, man. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Leon Chambers. Uh, we met a few months ago. I am extremely grateful to be here. I, uh, I'm ex- extremely excited to be a part of this read. Um, I wanted to talk about how it, how it was formed. Um, after Faith gave her presentation, we were so fired up about this. Uh, <laughs> no pun intended. We were extremely excited about this opportunity because uh, we want to make sure that the fire department is a all-inclusive environment and hopefully our actions can help um, improve policy that will um, make it welcoming to others. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leon, and we look forward to what Fire Reed is going to do this year. Um, so I think with that, uh, we have several key re- departments that I'm going to help uh, talk on behalf. Um, so we'll move over to our police read. And this is the makeup of our police read, um, a really uh, diverse, robust group that supports all the efforts of racial equity inclusion. And um, before I kind of get into this coaching piece, uh, when I was talking to Desmond Daniels, who is the REIT chair, um, he wanted me to highlight a couple community efforts, too, where they have been um, in support of the Juneteenth, our first inaugural Bloomington Juneteenth that just passed, and supporting with providing ice creams to family and friends and residents and community members out at uh, Candy High School, in addition to having yard games displays and support and just being in the community, building relationships and connections. So that was really fun and thrilling. In addition, they've also been in, um, going to give presentations and tabling at Kennedy High School to talk about who is the Bloomington Police Department and what do they do and how do they engage with community. Uh, on top of that, too, talking about career opportunities and pathways to be within a police department at the city of Bloomington. So those are some of the fun community experts uh, or community engagement they've been doing. And to this slide here about coaching, uh, they wanted to continue to embed and build that connections and relationships within the community. And so with the support of several key police officers, they were able to enact on some coaching on the last year and this current year. So this current year, they were able to um, get support from Detective Degoe to help with the Bloomington Ice Garden and Skate School that were held uh, two classes weekly from November to January. So that was really exciting. So you can see some photos here of that support with the Bloomington Ice Garden Skate School. And then currently there are five officers coaching softball. And there's a big reveal tomorrow that Desmond um, told me about where, um, again, through the coaching process, they're not in uniform. But then at the last day of um, that coaching day, they show up in uniform just to um, be prideful and how they communi- continue to connect and be a service to the community. And so that's going to happen tomorrow, and that's going to be really exciting to see. And then some other additional exciting things that the police racial equity action team is rolling out uh, fairly quickly here. You can see here they can have 
on July 20th um, for internal connections and community building with key staff and city employees. They're having a battle of the egg rolls. Um, so they're going to have this held at um, Civic Plaza in the lunchroom here. And you get a sample of free egg rolls. They're sponsoring that uh, from various restaurants. And you get a mark and choose uh, which egg roll you like best from which restaurant. And in addition to that, um, again, with engaging with an internal staff, they're going to also offer um, police department tours as well. Well, so within our city employees, they can get a uh, better understanding of, again, who the police department is and where you can go see the spaces and what that looks like. Additionally, another um, event on an external level, they're going to have a summer cookout. So they started the first summer cookout last year, and it was very successful at Bloomington, uh, Blooming Meadows. Um, and so they wanted to do it again this year. So that's going to be held on July 27th. And they are partnering with Hometown Church, who is going to sponsor their free food and burgers and hot dogs and beverages and snacks with the community at um, Blooming Meadows. And so that's really exciting because they also get key city divisions and departments to also be there to table, talk about the city services, resources, and what's there to offer from the city. And so that was really exciting as well. So those are some key updates from Police Reed. I was going to say, Chief Hodges, you got anything to share? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, next here, I want to highlight our community services racial equity action team, and uh, this is the makeup of the group. Um, we have uh, Diane, Emily, Dan, Afav, and Tracy. And some of the work that they've been working on here, the next slide here, is the Public Health Mobile Health Hub. So this is something newly launched this year where um, the Public Health Division wanted to ensure that they are continuing to serve Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield in meeting community where they are at. And so the hub features immunization screenings, work appointments, um, and much more. And it's very colorful. Um, they have fun toys and activities within the mobile hub. And guess what? It has air conditioning. <laughs> so that's also really exciting for uh, our community members to also be in the mobile hub to just learn and get those um, healthy screenings going as well. Um, community Services Read also last year supported uh, within the Bloomington Pride celebration. They had a little over 3,000 attendees this year. Um, they are, uh, are partnering with the um, this year, the Bloomington Pride Celebration is being partnered through uh, Twin Cities Pride, who is the nonprofit that organizes Twin Cities Pride at Loring Park. And so with this new partnership, um, it would ensure the support to grow uh, the Bloomington Festival in the years to come. And this year's um, Pride is going to be held on Sunday, September 10th from 12 to 2 at Bloomington Civic Plaza. Um, additionally, the language access plan, they continue to support that effort and providing training and providing meaningful access um, so that our limited English proficiency individuals and community members can get access to city services resources uh, within the language um, of their spoken and or um, written language. And then um, this was mentioned earlier already through our HREIT or Administration Racial Equity Action Team, but um, Community Services REIT was also in collaboration and support of the community involvement time of ensuring that our city employees can continue to volunteer their time and be in community and build connections and um, bring that service as well. Next here we have our information technology, uh, racial equity action teams, and um, who they are. They have Amy Cheney, Mario, Liz, Kyle, Greg, and Bob, a part of that group. And some key efforts that they worked on is um, to continue to enhance the work culture by discussing the importance of equity and inclusion in the workplace. Some examples they've done that this year is um, having Tamales Day, where within their division, they were able to have Tamales Days to recognize Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, in addition to, they've had topic conversations regarding uh, racial equity and inclusion within each of their division teams and also highlighting key heritage months conversations and engaging in dialogue about key champions within um, each of those heritage months. Um, in addition to that too, uh, this year I found out that they all been collectively reading a book uh, together and reading various chapters on racial equity issues um, and having dialogue and conversations more deeply about what that means and what that looks like. Uh, the second piece is, is that they continue to assist and develop cross-departmental REIT initiatives that reach the community at large. So as an internal-facing 
um, department, they really help and support um, all the departments within the organization and what are their initiatives and what are the key work plans that they have. And so they do a lot of support in that area as well. You wanna do this, Melissa? <laughs> oh wait, let me go back, okay. Uh, Councilmember Alessandro. I had one question about the yes. information technology one, if I can. Uh, Padal, I apologize for putting you on the spot. You don't have to answer it if you can't. I was just kind of curious. Um, I know we talk about these as racial equity action teams. There's a lot of intersectionality associated with those. Specifically, when I think about IT, I think about things like um, accessibility of our digital platforms and that kind of thing. Do you know if there's any kind of areas of focus there that they're considering, um, knowing that IT is a bigger player in that space, at least for our digital properties? Yeah, I know that there are some small increments of projects that they are supporting within each department and what are the key um, goals they have for how they want that accessibility to look like. I just don't know the exact details, but there are small pockets within different departments that they're supporting that effort in. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Melissa, the floor is yours. All right. Um Mayor members, uh, the legal REIT uh, is comprised of these four members right now. Um, we had we used to have a couple more, but um, they have moved on to other positions and other places. So we are always accepting applications, uh, and we are excited about uh, some of our newest additions as well. Next slide. So we have these two updates, and I also have a Just Deeds update. Um, the restorative court, um, if you recall, this is a shared project with Hennepin County. Uh, it's a, technically a Hennepin County employee, and then the city has a uh, match um, to assist with the payment of staff services. So we currently have one uh, social worker assigned to our restorative court. Uh, that we stood up. Uh, each uh, city has its own type of restorative court. Uh, we have one that is tailored to the types and distribution of crimes that occur in Bloomington. And um, we were recently notified, coming to a budget memo near you, um, that um, we have reached our capacity at the restorative court and um, have been, Hennepin County has indicated to us that they would like to have another uh, person assigned and so I encourage them to reach out uh, to their folks in Hennepin County because they're Hennepin County employees. So we'll see where that goes. Um, but the exciting thing is that it's been hugely successful and uh, the challenge is that we don't want to turn people away that are otherwise qualified to participate. Uh, the second update is um, that we made a decision uh, earlier this year, thanks to the support of finance and Jamie in particular, who we talked through with this. Um, we had historically been charging for evidence. Um, some other jurisdictions do not. And we made a decision uh, in balancing the staff time required to process all of those checks and um, uh, transition or transfers of money for relatively small amounts um, to get tr criminal discovery uh, that we would stop charging for evidence and be um, like many of our counterparts. Um, we also believe that this would promote access to justice and that people would be able to review their um, their discovery uh, for their criminal justice um, experience regardless of their ability to pay. So um, this has been successful. We've been implementing it for about a month now. Uh, well, I guess, wait a minute, 10 days. Um, it feels like a long month. Um, uh, and um, and I, have, I haven't heard anything about it, which probably tells me that um, it's going well. So um, lastly, on Just Deeds, um, uh, if you recall, during the last budget uh, memo uh, and carryovers, we requested a law clerk. Um, we had a law clerk uh, join us. Uh, she's now preparing to take the bar exam in about 10 days. Uh, she worked on our Just Deeds um, city-owned properties and was able to, we all attended the training and learned how to do it. And uh, she put together the paperwork to discharge the city properties, thanks to the assistance of the folks in community development, specifically Glenn um, and some others um, down there who worked um, with us very closely on that. Um, we have one step left for the Torrens properties and one step left on the abstract properties. And we hope to move those forward as well. So I would say within the next quarter, we should probably have um, discharged those racially restrictive covenants on city-owned land. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. And with that, that is an update of our racial equity action team. So as you can see, within all 10 departments, there are um, key champions and continue to do the work within practices, policies, and procedures in each of the REITs. And um, again, our uh, city employees are the best at knowing what those practice policies and procedures are to continue to support the effort to create a more racially equitable and inclusion and belonging space. So thank you. And I thank think you. Thank you for the presentation and thanks to everybody who presented this evening. It is greatly appreciated. Council Member Lohman, a question? So before you sit down, <laughs> uh, I did... Yeah, I did, have a, I did have a few questions that I wanted to ask because I do think there are questions that, that, that are, are asked, you know, beyond, you know, here that I wanted to be sure. We, there's a lot of projects that we saw today, a lot of staff time that's uh, spent um, uh, on on these uh, these particular projects. And, um, and I know you've sort of stated this, but I want to just ask the question directly. Uh, why is it important that we do these projects? And maybe this is a faith question. I'm not sure. But uh, I want to at least raise that to give you the opportunity to, to respond. I have my own response, but I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> faith, feel free to join me too. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Loman, for asking that question. Um, it's really important to continue to embed racial equity actions um, within each of the departments. Again, because we know that systemically there are policies, practices, and procedures put in place within municipality and government um, that also creates barriers and that is not accessible to key um, marginalized, underserved, underrepresented communities. And so by inactivating racial equity action teams within all departments, we're able to then um, have key lens that are embedded within everyday life that we provide practices and policies that could be more equitable and accessible to our community here, specifically in the city of Bloomington. And again, we lean in on the effort of training and supporting our key staff in that effort because they know the policies, the practice um, at best. And myself and Faith, we come in to also then provide our racial equity lens to say, well, have you thought of this? Have you considered this? Or here are some tools and resources that you can look into. We often refer back to um, GARE, the Government Alliance, Alliance Race Equity, uh, to talk about the tools and resources that they can provide as well to each of the REITs. And Faith, if you want to... <laughs> Thank you for that response uh, with that. Just a couple more, more questions here. Um, so then uh, I'll go to this one here. There's some folks who ask, you know, and we've asked this many a times and you've answered this many a times, but I think sometimes if you're just picking up on this midway through the process, um, you may have missed when we originally talked about this. There's always this question, well, why racial equity as opposed to just simply um, equity uh, and inclusion? Yes, thank you again, Council Member Lohman, for that question. Um, why racial equity specifically is because we know at the forefront that there are also implicit and unimplicit bias that occurs. And by having a key lens on racial equity, we're able to then name the issue and address the issue and come up with the solutions for those issues. And so um, when we look at different laws created, uh, we know that even example with the Chinese Exclusion Act that was created, it was all based on race. When we looked at redlining, we know that predominantly marginalized and black African-American communities was at the forefront of being harmed within that redlining uh, through the government policy. And so by having a lens on racial equity, um, it's really targeting and specifically naming and calling out um, what are the key issues that uh, were put in place in law that created barriers and um, also continue to um, inactivate uh, the just the uh, systemic barriers that continues to occur within communities that could continue to grow and prosper. So essentially what we're saying is it's not just racial stuff, but, you know, that's where the epics, you know, the, uh, it starts there and then it kind of emanates out there. So I uh, thank you for, for, for clarifying that. So then the final question that I have for you, um, and let me just set the context for it, is that we, you know, as a, as a council um, and as, um, I know, as our, uh, as our, Residents joined together as we put together our strategic uh, plan. Um, you know, we looked at a data book um, uh, in terms of the demographic shifts and changes that we're having with the city. And, and in a sense, we're, we're, we're investing uh, in this in very important, uh, uh, not only concept, but just a completely different paradigm shift as we look at the world. It, it, it makes us, and this question is coming, <laughs> uh, this is an important, as we make this paradigm shift, uh, uh, there's an important piece of this that's going to prepare our city for the future. 
Uh, as we talk about being a remarkable city that's welcoming to all folks, I love the, the, the statement that you guys had, which is a vibrant, safe, and healthy place for all. Love that. Uh, there is qualitative and quantitative measures that are done through these things. How do we know that we've succeeded with the investment that we've made here in all of these activities that we talked about tonight? Michelle, I'm going I'm to jump in mm -hmm. on this one. Uh, Mayor, Council, Councilmember Lohman, I think that's a really important question about how do we measure the impact of our work. And in fact, spoiler alert, we're going to talk about that on July 24th when we come back and give sort of the comprehensive overview of the work that we're doing in the organization. So we can do a cliffhanger. So we want to come back. And <laughs> well, I, I think the cliffhanger would be to tune in on July 24th so that you can go through and sort of like really uh, hear that story, that a data field story that talks about sort of what progress are we making in the organization? What changes are we seeing? And then I think to your point about uh, why this work is important and sort of the impact that it has on community. We've talked uh, at length about sort of like the change in demographics and how the workforce is shifting and how racial inequities have cost the state of Minnesota millions and millions of dollars. And so the work that we're doing here in Bloomington is not only important for our community and for our st as staff, it's important for the sustainability of us as a city. And so we're really excited to not only be doing sort of important work from a moral perspective, but work uh, that is really uh, intentional and uh, that has a business inclusive purpose as well and so we'll be telling more of that story on july 24th for those of you in the audience and those of you tuning in online please come back that's your cliffhanger uh the only other thing that i'll add to that is that before Fidel did an amazing job with this presentation and uh side note i know jimmy we're over 30 minutes but i have to throw this in here i i hope that you all can see sort of the amazing benefit that came with adding additional work to the office of racial equity inclusion and belonging i i would not be disappointed if we got a little bit more, but I'm super excited about having two people uh, doing this work and being able to expand our capacity. And Patel is, is great at that work. Um, and so he did a great job in responding to that question, Council Member Lohman. The only other thing that I would add is that this work is intersectional. And so we lead with race because we know that government sort of is a perpetuator and created race as we know it uh, and has a, a role to play in the racial inequities in this community. But the work that we do in our office is intersectional. Uh, we have sort of like people working with us and 10 different departments of all races and are inclusive of all faiths and all genders. And so uh, while we uh, have the racial equity action teams, the Office of Racial Equity Inclusion and Belonging is an intersectional organization and we utilize an intersectional approach to our work. Um, and look forward to more on July 24th. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the questions, Councilmember Lohman. And uh, the responses and thanks to everyone who presented tonight it is appreciated it's great to see the great work going on in the city and um and faith i appreciate your your answer as well as to the value that this brings not only to our community uh but but beyond and i really do appreciate that so thank you very much councilmember d'alessandro sorry mr mayor i just feel the urge to like maybe state um, something that I think is really important that, that I heard tonight that um, uh, we have to keep in mind, especially uh, for those of us that are uh, white up here on council, um, people of color didn't define themselves as other in this country. We did that to them. And that's why race is important because we are the ones that made those rules and we are the ones that need to then help unmake those rules so that they can see themselves as the whole people that they should be seeing themselves from day one. And I think that we forget about that sometimes. So um, I'm just, that's not an admonishment to anybody up here. Obviously, I think we all agree on this stuff, but I think it's important, uh, an important lens for white people to think about this work through. So thanks, appreciate the point of privilege. Thank you for the comment. We're gonna move on to item three on our agenda, our consent business. And Councilmember D'Alessandro, you have our consent business this evening. I Council do, Mr. Member Mayor. D'Alessandro. Yes, thank you, sir. I have uh, a hold from uh, Councilmember Lohman on 3.1. I have a hold for myself on 3.4 and a hold for uh, Councilmember Nelson on 3.5. I don't think they'll take long to think there are more questions of, of clarification, but I, um, if there aren't any more from anybody, I don't see anything else, I can uh, move uh, to uh, adopt 3.2 and 3.3. Second. Uh, motion and a uh, second to adopt 3.2 through 3.3. 3. 
were we not going to do 3.6 or was there a hole in 3.6? I'm sorry, that's my fault. I didn't even, I oh, okay. was too far down and I missed it. My okay. apologies. Let me restate my motion. Uh, I move to approve 3.2, 3.3, and 3.6. Thank you. Uh, second. We have a motion to approve 3.2, 3.3, and 3.6 in tonight's consent business. Any further council discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Item 3.1. Mayor, that was yep. that's Mayor Maloman. That was mine. Um, so this one is a resolution of a budget adjustment to transfer HRA and port funds to the city facilities fund. I know I did talk with the city manager about this at a, um, maybe about six weeks ago, um, but then I got a call from um, uh, somebody uh, right before the meeting, uh, so I didn't have the opportunity to, to mention it uh, to you. But the, their their chief concern was um, uh, about the amount. Uh, that was being uh, allocated for this. Um, that uh, that the, there was some thinking that there was going to be more than the three hundred thousand that was was in this uh, amount here. And then the other concern was that um, uh, whether or not the staff wanted to see this change. And uh, so I don't know if you want to comment on that or even can comment on that. And I, and I would, before I even ask these questions, I want to preface this, that I'm uh, nervous about even asking the questions because I don't know that this is the proper role of a council member because I, I really do, truly believe there's a policy side of things, which this kind of creeps a little bit into that, um, uh, into that administrative piece of it. And so really where my question is, is uh, uh, for uh, office creation, uh, is this a reasonable amount to spend uh, for one, and then my, my secondary policy question is from a policy perspective, is really around the idea of, uh, you know, you know, uh, in terms of I don't even know how I can even ask the staffing question. So you decide if you want to respond to that or not. And Mr. Brugge, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Loman. Uh, first on the item itself, the, uh, this is well. Let me ask your first question: Is this a council issue? Anytime we're allocating funds, it is a council issue. Uh, the the funds that we're talking about here were already approved by the HRA and the Port Authority uh, within their budgets for this year. The council just has to approve the transfer of those funds. Um, and uh, it is reflective of the share of the proposed modifications uh, for each of those divisions within community development. So, you know, they have the, their portions of the office space that will be affected. They're contributing towards the project itself. Uh, we don't have the total cost of the project just yet because we're, we're uh, back out there from the initial design that was created last year following significant employee engagement um, that uh, we need to update the costs because I imagine there's been some escalation uh, in both labor and, and materials. Um, so we will be coming back to council uh, when we have that final cost because it will require allocation of um, other sources of funds, what city funds or, or somewhere else. So um, first question is uh, that you asked about the, the funds. Yes, it's the council. Uh, action second um, there's been th there was significant employee engagement last year when we went through the planning of this process recognize that not everybody's going to be happy about it as people's working stations are likely to be modified for some people it's more and some people it's less uh, and recognize that that change is impactful in a number of ways and let me clarify my, my question um, and, and I know you don't have the total amounts now but uh, in terms of trying to do, do a redesign, and I understand this is almost an impossible question to answer because it, depending on where it is and what the building is and, and all those kind of things, those all factor into it. Uh, so my question is, is this a reasonable amount? Because uh, I know, you know taxpayers are paying for this, uh, but you know, you know, does, does this fit within what is a reasonable amount of money to be spending for a redesign of a, an office space? Mr. Mr. Is, Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, I think one person's reasonableness is uh, different than another person's. Uh, I will tell you that we will get the best pricing that we can because we have to go through uh, the public process for uh, you know this in terms of making sure that uh, we we follow the rules about um, uh, you know getting uh, getting competitive yeah competitive bids on the project. So the price is what the price is, and then it's up to the council to determine if it's an acceptable price. In this circumstance, uh, we have. 
a, a large department, uh, and the modifications are uh, changing around the orientation because we've had a fair amount of reorganization within that department over the last couple of years. Uh, the previous workstations were original to this building, so they're reaching 20 years of age. Um, they're still in working condition, but we, uh, we we have other reasons to move forward with the with the redesign. And so, office furniture uh, is uh, not cheap. I'll just say that. And for those of you who work in office environments, you probably know that. Yep. Questions answered, Councilmember Lowman? Yeah, no, I, I right. think there's any analysts. There, unless there is anything else. Uh, if there's or, nothing else, uh, I'd look for action on item 3.1. Well, then I'll go ahead and move this thing here since I held it up here. Um, I'll move to approve the budget adjustment resolution to accept 135000 from uh, uh, Housing and Redevelopment Authority and 165000 from the Port Authority uh, to the City Facilities Fund for the office space needed in community development. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to accept item 3.1 in our consent business. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Item 3.4. Yes, Mr. Mayor, that was the one I held, and I, I was just hoping that somebody could maybe um, expound a little bit on what that community engagement discussion was, because, I number one, I'm grateful for it. Um, I know that the residents, um, um, especially the ones explicitly around um, that property, were um, were actively engaged in the process of, of that development, um, and it I'm hopeful that it means that we've come to good resolution in terms of their comfort with things like the lighting there, the noise there, the other stuff like that. So if, if anybody could articulate that, it would be wonderful. Mr. Berbrugge. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, Chief Seal is not here. Um, I, I believe the extent... Uh, Carl, you got it? Okay, good. So uh, I don't think we did broad engagement. I think it was direct engagement because you have two properties that are most directly yeah. impacted. As you know, it's in your district, so you're familiar with it. Uh, Carl? Mr. Thank Field. You. Good evening. Uh, as the manager indicated, uh, it was not a, a broad engagement process, but was specific to the adjoining properties. And as that project has developed, uh, there have been lots of discussions with adjoining property owners about how what kind of modifications might be done. Uh, not to say that there might be other things that the, the adjoining properties are not happy with. This is one piece that they were happy that we were able to accommodate. So we're moving ahead with that. Yeah. And can you articulate specifically what it is? It doesn't actually tell us. I mean, it sounds like uh, there's an amendment to maybe in, increase its height or something like that. Or It was the original plan was a, as I understand, was a chain link fence along that property line. Uh, what's being proposed is an eight foot high privacy fence along that side. So it... It uh, blocks some of the view of the, of the fire station, which was perceived to be larger and more intrusive by the adjoining property than they had perceived the plans before it was constructed. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. That's it. I just wanted to make sure we had good. an understanding. I appreciate the efforts there. I know that this has been a, a long time coming. Is there an open house planned for that property? You don't have to answer that now. We can take care of it in 5.3. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, when we uh, opened fire station number three, which was our first new fire station in many, many years, uh, we had hoped to have that type of community event, but we opened in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so we are hopeful that we will have a, a community event that will allow people to see the investment that we're making in modernizing our facility. So when we have a date for, uh, set for that, we will let you know. Thank you. All right, with that, then I will move to approve First Amendment to the Services Agreement with Century Fence Company for providing fence services to Fire Station 4 to increase the contract amount by $21,311 for a total contract not to exceed amount of 77, three, uh, sorry, 736. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman to accept item 3.4 as stated on tonight's consent business. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And our final item tonight, item 3.5 on our consent business. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Super quick here. I just wanted to strike the words front yard from this resolution um, based on conversation and information I received from staff that this may end up actually being the side yard uh, once they make the determination that's a corner lot so they can choose which one. But uh, they almost certainly would choose the other street to be the front yard. Um, and so I just want to strike that. I think it's very clear that it's 81st Street and we're modifying that, um, granting that variance. I, I support the variance. So, 
Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Nelson, staff's amenable to that change. If you saw the information provided uh, today that was recommended by the planning manager as an option to the council if you wish to do that. Thank you. Um, Council Member Nelson, please. With, with that, uh, I would move that in the case of PL 2023-64, having been able to make the required findings, uh, to adopt a resolution approving a variance to reduce the setback along West 81st Street from 30 feet to 18.9 feet for a new single family dwelling at 8101 Wentworth Avenue South, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Second. Motion by Councilmember Nelson, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to accept item 3.5 on our consent business as stated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Moving on to item four on our agenda, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And we have one public hearing this evening, item 4.1. It's a public hearing on an ordinance amending Chapter 17 and Appendix A of the City Code related to right-of-way fees. Good evening once again, welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Scott Anderson with Utilities, and with me is Eric Schoen, our Customer Services Supervisor, so if we get into the weeds deeper than I'm accustomed to, he can hopefully help us out <laughs> with that. Is there, okay, loading a presentation. Give that just a second. Okay, here we go. So uh, what we're talking about here, a uh, section of city code that addresses fees for uh, work within the right-of-way. Um, and when, when I say work within the right-of-way, we're talking about work typically done by utility companies, gas, electric, telecommunications, and others working within the, the city-controlled right-of-way. The, the, this section of code, these fees were last updated in 2006. And really what, what kind of precipitated um, the opportunity for these changes were changes to our internal workflow, um, as well as, as kind of a years of informal feedback from, uh, from utility companies and those, those performing that work. Um, background, right-of-way fees are intended, intended to provide full staff cost recovery for review, permit review, processing, and inspections necessary to complete work to city standards. So in the most basic of terms, um, we're reviewing plans to make sure they're not gonna put util other util private utilities through public infrastructure. They're, gonna, they're going to uh, put that, in that infrastructure in places that allow us to, to expand our infrastructure in the future if needed, um, and they're gonna leave the right away in a condition um, equal to or better than, than how they found it. Um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, really working on some internal um, efficiencies to, to help simplify uh, this, this structure a little bit. And then just kind of just some, some pictorial examples of kind of what this looks like. You know, on the left, we're, you know, we're talking about getting out and, and walking a running line or doing a preliminary uh, site uh, visit to make, make sure what we think is out there is out there. Um, and then and then doing the inspection of the underground utilities, um, be that a long running line of, of buried cable or pipe or or a terminal point in, installation of a cabinet or a junction box of some kind. And then on the, the restoration side, um, soft surface restoration, seed, sod, erosion control, hard surface um, pavement, curbing, um, things of that nature. So this, this slide gives um, an example of, of some existing um, right-of-way permit fee examples compared to what, what we're proposing. Um, you can see in the case of Excel and CenterPoint, and I'll talk a little bit in the next couple slides on, on how this comes, this, this comes to be, but um, kind of what some existing permit fees would be versus uh, the proposed. What's missing from this slide are, are some areas, and, and we'll see that in a couple slides as well. For example, a, a one-hole excavation under the current fee structure is $208. That will increase to $560. Um, a one-fixture installation, you know, be it a pole or, or a cabinet, um, goes from $175 to $560. But what this does 
Um, this addresses a larger share of projects, particularly larger projects, um, and, and makes those a little more, um, a little more palatable. This slide provides a look at 2022, just simple forms, total per, uh, simple formats, uh, total permits, um, and then average cost uh, for us to, to process and inspect those permits. Gives you an idea of um, trying to, to demonstrate that the magnitude of, of where we've landed um, seems to be consistent um, to a certain degree. And again, looking at 2022, first part of 2022 and the first part of 2023, again, just total permits and average cost to date. So option one, for, for lack of better description, this is our current, our current rate structure. Um, somewhat complicated, difficult for applicants to, to understand and often led to surprises when, when hey, here's your permit fee. It's, $15,000 and um, trying to figure out, trying to understand how that came to be and, and kind of walking through that with them. Um, and the, the biggest issue with this structure is it just, it didn't scale well to larger projects. So um, a telecommunication project, for example, looking to extend services to a larger neighborhood, um, those those fees would, would could become quite large, um, well in excess of, of the actual effort and, and labor needed on the part of the city to actually perform, perform that work and potentially became a hindrance to the expansion of those services. Um, option two, what, what's being proposed is a flat fee of $560 and this is based on a five-year average of total permits um, and, and, the, and our cost to do that. Um, so a fairly simple um, Calculation. I know we, we took a question earlier from Council Member Lohman on, on looking at some of the, the intricacies of, of the components of, of what goes into each permit under the old structure. Um, we, we, don't, we don't necessarily have you know, all that in order to tell you that you know, um, we spend X amount of dollars on just whole excavation permits versus running line permits. Um, the, the flat fee will will expedite permit review. It, it doesn't penalize, it may you know, potentially encourage um, larger, more complex projects. However, um, we've been, you know, the communication we've had with utility companies, you know, their drivers are their customers, their levels of service. Um, the, the permit fee really has, has only come up, you know, really as, as an obstacle for those larger projects um, um, when, when, when they reach a certain size. And then, as I mentioned, you know, this is intended to remove any barriers for expansion of those of those services. Uh, residential utility permit fee was looked at also. Current fee is two hundred eight dollars, and this would be if a homeowner needs to do a sewer dig or or something out in the street, and and that fee uh, would be reduced to one hundred fifty dollars. Internal review included um, the the rapid racial equity. Uh, impact analysis and discussion uh, with with Faith and her team. Um, it was a, you know another challenging REIA in terms of um, data. Um, what what do we you know we're talking about issuing permits to utility companies? Um, how does that you know how do those how does that directly relate to and impact our our residents? A um, little bit hard to dig into. Um, but what, what, what stood out to us the most was um, the removal of a potential barrier for expansion of services that, that the public uh, generally be looking to, to utilize, and then just the, the overall lowering of that fee for, for all residential customers um, as, as a benefit. Um, had discussions uh, with finance for budgetary implications, and again, the the existing fee as well as the proposed fee are, are both fully intended for uh, that full cost recovery for staff time and, and equipment and of course legal review. So with that, our, our recommendation would be for council to adopt uh, the resolution as outlined amending uh, chapter 17, appendix A uh, fee schedule associated with right away uh, permits. I can take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. 
looking for questions here, Council. Um, so the one that I was puzzling through as I read this, and then to hear your presentation, the understanding that there has to be that nexus between the cost of what it takes to put the fee together, or, or to put the, to do the to do the permit, basically, and then the fee amount that can be charged. So I'm, I'm puzzled how we can go to an average, and this could survive a legal challenge one way or another. Wouldn't somebody be able to say, well, you don't have that direct nexus between the work that went into it and the fee that you're being charged right now? Mayor, um, pot potentially, um, although I think, I think that flat fee um, goes a longer way toward um, not allowing that argument versus the existing fee. I think we, we, we were potentially running into that under the existing structure for those larger projects. Um, we've seen uh, the potential for permit fees in the, you know, the $18,000 range uh, for a project. And, you know, we were not going, you know, that was based on that existing structure and, and we just simply were not likely to to expend those amount of resources um, um, to complete that work, so I think the the flat fee where you know the there's I think a, you know a an apparent benefit to those larger projects potentially um, at the at the cost of some of those smaller um, installations. Mm -hmm. However, um, you know if you're you're talking about you know an existing two hundred dollar installation, you know, for a cabinet, you know, single cabinet installation, for example, current fee is $208, mm -hmm. going to $560. Um, I don't know that that difference is, is measurable. Um, I mean, certainly it's measurable. It's, mm -hmm. it's double. But I think in the scale of, of the construction and what those costs are, I, d I don't think that that change in that permit fee is, is significant to, to raise that issue. Mr. Babrugi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Scott, in, in the course of developing the recommendation, we also consulted with the utilities who are the primary permit payers, correct? And the, their feedback in response to this proposal was? Was, was positive. Um, I think um, I, I don't, we, we didn't have anybody express a concern with regard to the flat fee as being problematic. I think um, most of them looking forward to, you know, mo um, you know that the simplicity of of navigating the flat fee ske uh, schedule or structure versus uh, what we have in place, as well as the prospect of getting away from those exceptionally large fees for their larger projects, because a lot of them seem to have some larger renewal. Just like every utility, we we talk about asset renewal. They've got the same things coming, and 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 so I think this is appealing to them in that matter. The other thing I'd like to point out too is, you know, obviously we would, you know, we'll be reviewing this on an annual basis to make sure we're hitting the mark, continuing to take comments and information from utility companies and, and if there's, if something isn't adding up um, or working out as we think, you know, we'll, we'll be back um, looking for a revision. Well, I, I guess I can't say I'm shocked to hear that companies that would, might see their fees go from 18000 to $500 might be in favor of it, and that's, that's the problem that's, with that. That's a, uh, you know, a unique one, but mm -hmm. it's... I, I understand. Um, and, and then I would guess I, I, I would direct you, but maybe even to uh, Mr. Fabrugge also, uh, will, would, would this then kind of pave the way to us looking at all fees like this? Uh, flat fee uh, schedules for, for everything that we charge fees for in the city of Bloomington? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, we haven't had that specific discussion at a staff level across all fees. Um, we have discussed uh, the, the, you know, the the possibility of having a more vigorous fee study than uh, than we have had recently. You know, we've not done one of those in quite a while, and uh, I think we do. Um, well, not I think. We do uh, informal surveys of our peer cities to see where their fees are across a number of areas to make sure that um, we're either not falling behind or not getting out of step with anybody, and I think that we're keeping track. Uh, the process of doing a much more comprehensive fee study is, um, is pretty intensive, so uh, we, we should probably do it at some point in the future. I don't think it's critical that we do it now. Yeah. Councilmember Dallas and then Councilmember Lohman. Councilmember Dallas 
Thank you. This is a related question, maybe, and so tell me if it's off topic and I'll defer to another time. But one of the things I've heard a lot about with our you with um, some of the work that's gone do down in my neighborhoods is that people have been really unhappy with the maintenance, the, 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 the post, what, I forget what you called it in your presentation, I apologize, like the post work work where it's things like resodding and, and all of that kind of stuff. And I know that I've mentioned more than once somebody, I've, I've, I've forwarded on, you know, complaints and things like that to the maintenance staff. Um, is, is there, is, is, I guess, is this related to that in the sense that those the fees as part of this include that, number one, right? And number two, what is the remedy for, uh, or should there be a remedy, or should there be additional charges? Should there be a need for a remedy um, as it relates to this kind of work? And so, that, like I said, that could be another topic for another day, and I appreciate that, but it, it's relevant to this because most of the time it seems to be um, you know, Excel or Centerpoint or somebody else that does this utility work that ends up causing the particular problem for the customer. Mayor, Councilmember D'Alessandro, it is, is definitely part of this and, and restoration is, is a part of that inspection process. Um, it, it does become challenging, whether uh, drought thing, you know, make things like seed and sod um, not as successful um, as it can be, um, but we work with the utility companies and their contractors to, um, and the residents to try and, and reach resolution and, and get to that um, as, as best we can through the, through the course of construction and that permitting process. As, as far as, as what type of um, recourse we have, I mean, we have future permit issuances um, and things of that nature. Um, they, uh, utility companies, are, are, their contractors are bonded, um, but typically that's, that's more toward you know, getting to damage and, and things. Um, so it's it's been traditionally a, a back and forth with the utility and their contractors to to get that restoration where it needs to be. A lot of times, unfortunately, um, it, it takes longer than, than property owners would like it to, um, but it's definitely definitely part of it and something we're working on constantly. Yeah, if I, if I may, Mr. Mayor, I, just to clarify, you know, I'm, I'm wondering in my own head if there's like, Hey, if this is a if this is a right of way permit that includes the destruction, and I'm using that's my term, not anybody else's term, the destruction of somebody's you know well manicured, right front lawn yard, whatever you want to call it, um, is there a reason to add more f fee because you know you're going to have to go back in year two, for example, and resod because it's not all going to take, or you know those kinds of things. That was more or less what I was thinking about. You know, there are there are definitely projects where you know that you're going to have resident impact to their personal property, which is different than like being in the middle of the road. And I'm just wondering if we have a chance to potentially provide a, a mechanism here that provides a, a more well-rounded remedy. That's my thought. Thanks, Councilmember Delson. I just. Responded. I mean, I think that's something we could look at and consider one clarification, and it may be a distinction without a difference. All this work is occurring within the right of way, so it's it's not technically private property. I know how that's my front yard, and and I, we totally understand that. Um, but just wanted to make make that clarification. But it's something. I mean, we can certainly you know continue to consider um, you know based on on our, you know, our success in 2023 and, and keep an eye on that. It, it's very fair that you say that. Um, I'll, I'll restate the question. Um, we as homeowners have to maintain the right of way, even though we don't get to own it. So it'd be nice if we got a little help. Let's put it that fair, way. Totally thank you. Fair. Appreciate it. Council Member Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, to Council Member uh, D'Alessandro's uh, point, I was talking to a, a former uh, Council Member today and, you know, uh, we had the conversation about, about time. Uh, you know, that timing piece in there and that the way that it's written, that it, it's kind of, and I understand why we kind of done that because there may be weather or other things you just mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that may be a part of that. But I, I do too wish we could look at that as well um, and, and do something with that to kind of shorten up that time time period. I don't know how we do it. It's much easier to, to say it, but when, when you get ready to do it, you sometimes can create other kind of things. But just so you know, there's another council member who's interested in that. But um <clears throat> I uh, appreciate, Mayor, what you uh, had brought forward uh, in terms of that challenge piece. And I, you know, I'd certainly ask a number of questions, but I just want to just be sure that I'm clear because um, I know there's maybe it's legend um, among it, but I know that uh, there was a presentation at one point in time where uh, 
um, my understanding is Public Works came forward and we have a building and it's a certain size and now we found out that we've outgrown that size. And so my, my concern is uh, when I look at these fees um, as a piece of it, and I know that, you know, I certainly trust our finance department uh, to look at, you know, what's required there. And you mentioned that the full cost recovery um, what was the statement. And, and I just, as I look at those, the, the previous fees and then the current fees, I just am concerned. I know we can go back at this each year, so I don't want to, you know, dig down deep into the details of it all and try to do math up here, um, you know, on camera. I certainly do not want to do that. Um, but I just want to just be sure that I, I, my understanding is that the way that this is structured and set up is that we're going to, um, at the end of the year, uh, the, you know, the minuses will equal the pluses and we'll have a balanced uh, uh uh, budget <laughs> coming out at the end. That's my main concern uh, as we make this change. Sure, Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, uh, as much as physically possible, looking back, um, you know, due to permit, um, you know, number of permits, type of work, type of things that happen on these sites, you know, we we get plans for a permit, um, we, de you know, turn, determine what that, that fee should be, and then you, you go out and for whatever reason, the work is dramatically different and more time is spent or less time is spent. And so over, you know, the course of, you know, the during the, you know, the five-year look back, we've been over some years, we've been under some years. And so, um, but but to your point, yes, the in, the intent is to make sure that we hit hit that number and, and hit that bullseye as, as best we can, understanding that construction is variable and, and a lot of things impact that we have certain fixed costs. Um, that, that will always be a part of it. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll be monitoring that. And, and if, if adjustments are needed, um, we'll be working on that in, in due time. I, I just appreciate that statement. And I just want to, I get nervous, you know, when we get the, the amount there and then we have a larger project and, and, and then somehow the cost is over that because then basically what we're doing is we're subsidizing that from other taxpayers, you know, uh, to do that. So um, I hope that that doesn't happen. <laughs> and uh, um, and certainly I trust that we'll bring it back and, and look at that if that's the case. So um, I, 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 can, I can support it with that, but I, I'm skeptical um, uh, of this change. But, you know, I'm going to, I mean, it's, everybody has looked at this and, and has, has put it forward. So um, thank you. Councilmember Nelson and then Councilmember Mua. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I've just got one question. Um, is there a significant difference in the amount of time staff spends based on the size and scale of a project? I mean, all projects have a similar number of things. You got to intake the thing, you got to review it, you got to approve it, you got to maybe have questions and you have back and forth with the applicant, um, and you got to inspect it, you got to finalize it. There's there's those series of steps and. Part of the reason I ask this is, you know, I don't pull permits of this type, but I pull other permits. And the reality is, is the difference between a large remodel and a medium-sized remodel, a small remodel, is probably 15 minutes on site. They all have the same inspections, you know, and, and all of that. And I, I'm just trying to get my head around because that's, that's the world I know. Is this similar to that, or is there a vastly different amount of time between the projects? Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, I'd say it depends. Okay. Um, yep. there, there will be instances where you're right. There, you know, de depending on the type of work being done, if it's, you know, a, a, a line, half mile of directional boring, you're, I mean, you're looking at, a, you know, a couple of excavate, you know, every so often, there's a hole to look at. Um, not too dis dissimilar to to a single installation or or something of that nature. Um, you, if a utility company has a particularly poor contractor, um, there's a lot more returning and back and forth uh, for that, you know, even if that's a small job than, than on some larger job. So it really depends. Um, I think um, your observation can be accurate and right on. And, and in other cases, you know, a larger, the, the, the center point energy Beltline project that came through here a number of years ago, that was a large project that required a lot of time. No way to compare that to 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 anything but um it it depends i hope that's okay mm -hmm. so, thank you so, some something to add on that before we get to council if i maybe well, i could put it in a perspective if you don't mind how many how many how many permit charges did you look at to come up with your average was that thousands or was that like hundreds or do you know i think you know I'm, we have, I think there were 900 and some, 911 permits in 2022. So I think roughly, 
you know, okay. eight or nine hundred permits per year. We looked at that that five year window. And that one or that one you described as an example of being like a true outlier. That would represent how many of the nine hundred? Boy, small percentage. very small percentage. Okay, great. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful, but I thought maybe put it up. Thank you. Apologies for the interruption. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I agree with the concerns that <clears throat> my fellow um, council members have. And the other thing I am concerned about too is if we go to a flat fee structure, does that encourage only large? Uh, projects and then does that discourage small projects in certain areas of the community that then continue to be underserved because it is more profitable or it is just less expensive to do large projects instead so that's something I am concerned about as well council member um, so I, I don't know that that the size of the project necessarily um, well I, I don't think the, the permit fee structure on its own will encourage or discourage these projects, small projects, as I mentioned, while while for a single installation that permit fee, yes, will double. It's still a very small component of the overall cost of that project. If you're installing a cabinet or a pole, um, the work that goes into that, you know, whether that fee is two hundred eight dollars or five hundred sixty dollars, it's it's a pretty small component. So I, I don't see that as getting in the way. I also don't see it as, and and this is based predominantly on, on feedback and conversations we've had with utility companies over the years with regard to this fee, the, this fee structure and these fees and, and their planned work. Um, their work, like I mentioned earlier, is, is planned out years in advance to, to either upgrade existing infrastructure, expand services, um, it, and, and so I, I, I don't see that, but it's something um, you know, we'll, we'll try to, to monitor and keep an eye on um, as best we can and, and continue to take feedback um, from utility companies on, on what they're thinking and, and what they're looking to do in the future. Well, I, I, I will say I, I appreciate the comments by the council here and I appreciate hearing some of the concerns brought forward and I like the back and forth and the explanations and so on. Uh, I can support this for a, the variety of reasons that you've put forward. Uh, I will say I've got some, I'm, I'm concerned uh, just a bit because, again, nobody who's, who's fee coming down from thousands to 560, they're not going to complain. But if we get enough people with the $200 to a $560, I mean, then they, they could actually say, well, there is no connection between the cost of this fee and you, you just pulled that number out of, a, out of an average. So uh, if I'm thinking of that, others have as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not breaking any new ground here, right? So uh, that's, that's my concern. I, I understand they're used uh, in other communities and used successfully and, and have stood up. Uh, if it can be, uh, if it can help us to expedite things and if it can help to simplify things, I think it, it probably makes this worthwhile and, and I can work past some of the concerns that I do have. And it's an opportunity, I think, to uh, continue as we keep talking about to be a bit more business friendly here in Bloomington and try and make this uh, a bit uh, uh, an easier organization and operation to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So for those reasons, I think I could support this and uh, see where this leads us. Council, are there any other questions or comments, concerns on this? Anyone like to move a motion forward on this? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. We talked so long on it, I forgot there was a public hearing. <laughs> That was the hearing. That was the hearing, I guess, yes. <laughs> that was the motion to open the public hearing, and I will do just that. Thank you, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Item 4.1 this evening is a public hearing on an ordinance amending Chapter 17 and Appendix A of the City Code relating to the right-of-way fees. Anyone in the Council Chambers wishing to speak on this issue tonight? <clears throat> Mr. Sable, is there anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor, Council Member, is no one on the phone. Last call for anyone in the Chambers? Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Savig, um, um, mayor and members of the council. A um, couple of questions. Um, I'm a little disturbed. You, the last time this was changed was 2006, if I heard that right. I'm surprised that, well, let me continue. So, and city manager mentioned that informal surveys are done. Yet this seems to be kind of a sweeping change. So I have 
some of the same considerations. I don't have a lot of irons in the fire on this one. It just seems odd that it has been changed since 2006. The large scale ones are changing dramatically. I suppose you could say the small scale ones are changing dramatically as well. They're going up, but you know, that's for an increase from 2006, two and a half times isn't that huge. Um, but I'm just curious, why wouldn't this be something that, okay, if we're doing surveys of other cities, what has that shown? I mean, has it been in line for 15 years and then suddenly it's out of line this dramatically? Or, you know, I'm, I'm just a little surprised at the way we do, like, look at garbage rates, and I realize that's for every single residence in, in, in the city, but whereas permits are only if you're changing something, but it just seems that's an awfully long time and a sudden large change. And so I'm surprised and why it isn't on some sort of basis like that. Um, and secondly, in terms of, so in other words, if it's been so far off, it would seem to me that either we haven't done any big projects because if we had, there'd be huge profits at the ends of those years. If we'd done a huge project in that, in a given year, you'd expect if we're changing the rates that dramatically, you'd have huge profits that would send up a, a red flag. So again, mine, my, my concern is just we're changing it significantly and we haven't looked at it in a long time and yet there haven't been any signals that this should be looked at. So I guess those are my questions and those are the things I'm, I guess, you know, even as a citizen, I'd like to know that, you know, is that why a lot of areas don't have uh, fiber optic cable is because we you know, it was way too expensive to do that project. And so we nixed it, or we didn't, but the companies that had to put it in nixed it. So anyway, that's my my point. Um, I appreciate your comments, Mr. Sevig. Thank you. And I do think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Manager, but when you were talking about the, the uh, comparisons to other cities, we do that with a variety of fees, whether it's Greens fees, uh, correct. hourly rates at the ice garden, uh, the different work that we do. We, we, we work to keep in, in step, and so we're not out of line with the uh, fees charged by other cities. I took that, when you made that comment, you were talking fees in general as to specifically to, uh, to this type of fee. Is that correct? Mr. Mayor and Council Member, that is correct. I was speaking about fees across our entire enterprise. Yeah. Um, the fact is the question about why, you know, why does it seem to be so long since uh, we've evaluated this, the fact is that conditions don't change dramatically from year to year when it comes to this kind of service that we provide. Our, our costs are generally increasing at a pretty predictable rate. Our fees are adjusted most times annually that tries to keep up with essentially the cost of inflation. So there isn't really a, a reason that the fees or the cost to provide the service associated with that fee would become untethered from one another, like I said, because the, the there just isn't that much of a change. But over 15, 20 years, there's enough of a change that it warrants taking a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, quickly. Mayor, I just thought I'd respond with regard to the, the reference to the change in 2006. That's, re that's in reference to the structure. The fees have obviously been adjusted over time to, to keep up with, with costs and, and things of that nature. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the chambers wish to speak? Council seeing no one coming forward. I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. We got a motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to co close the public hearing on item 4.1. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries 6-0. Council, I want to apologize. My statements that I made earlier should have been made at this point, and I apologize for being out of order on that. I, I do not like that when during a public hearing when statements are made one way or another. That's inappropriate. Uh, I honestly lost track of where we were and that this was indeed a public hearing. So... 
Uh, I apologize for being out of order in that way. It uh, was was not a good look, and I apologize for that. So, Council, additional questions or comments? Now that we are in the official conversation point of uh, item 4.1, Councilmember D'Alessandro. I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. No worries. Um, I think it's been a long day. I think last week was a day, a week off for a lot of people, and I think coming back today, it's just been a rough re-entry, if you will. So I won't hold it against you if you don't hold it against me. Um, I did have one just kind of regular comment. I, I think as uh, as Councilmember Mua mentioned, you know, whenever we whenever we can, I think making sure we are able to identify and and provide the the most well formed fee for service that we can at the tiering that might be the most um, equitable, I think, is always a good thing for us to try. Um, you know, if if we're at a point right now where um, it does, um, you know, yield uh, challenges to our, our smaller projects um, and and then we don't have our bigger projects um, uh, in this with the same burden, um, then there is an imbalance that we need to look at. So I don't know if we have a plan for how we're going to monitor this. Um, you know, maybe to even the the, the um, uh, resident comment. You know, maybe we don't let it go 15 years before we make a structural change to the way that things are being done. Um, you know, if, if we can get that. And so I don't know if, if anybody can articulate for me the, the plan for that, but I'd, I'd love to make sure that this comes back in a, a year or whatever so that we're all able to, to assess, you know, the 900 that were pulled, what did they look like, what were their demographics, how big were the projects, you know, did we actually make money on these pulls or didn't we based on, you know, the size of the projects, that kind of thing. So I don't know if we can get that information, but if we could, that would be great. I think we can make that request to staff that we yeah. can revisit this about this time next year or yeah. maybe at the end of next year, maybe get 18 months under our belt and take a look at yeah. exactly what they are. I think that makes good sense. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Council Member Lohman. Uh, Mayor, I think you um, articulated, uh, while it may have been at a different point in time. I Inappropriate you, time. <laughs> but yeah. but, I, mean, but they, I think what you stated was well well stated, and I, I agree with that, uh, that take on it. There's only one other thing I want to add. Um, uh, um, a number of us council members, and I know uh, our, our uh, finance director attended the Ellers conference, and I'm always reminded when we get to these um, uh, times where we talk about these comparisons of other cities, um, it's just a reminder that we ought to be careful about those comparisons when we're, we're doing that. You know, sometimes it's we're, we're comparing apples and oranges and that type of thing. And we just want to be sure that we are you know, looking at our city fees separately. Um, and I just think that's a good uh, rule of thumb as we, we look at, at these fees and what is appropriate for our residents um, as we get ready to move forward on this. So, Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. I actually just have one quick question. Um, this doesn't have any budget implications for next year's budget, it, if I understand it correctly. The fees will be about in line. The costs will be about in line with what they would have been anyways. Mr. Mayor, council members, that's what we expect. Okay. And so, and then to council member D'Alessandro's point, um, at a minimum, we'll, if this doesn't work, it'll be a part of the budget discussion next year, <laughs> absolutely for certain. So, um, so I, but I just want to make sure that this, we're not making a budget decision tonight and it didn't seem like we were. So thank you. Very good. Council, if there is no more question or discussion on this, Council Member Lohman? Be happy to move this if you'd like. If that's what you're, I'm thinking that, you're that getting ready to move that Council way. Member, you're exactly right. All right, Mayor, I'd be happy to move a motion to approve an ordinance amending Chapter 17 and Appendix uh, A, Administrative Relief and Fee Schedule of City Code relating to right-of-way definitions of fees. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to approve an ordinance for amending Chapter 17 in Appendix A uh, in, uh, regarding right of way definitions and fees. No further Council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Council Member Lohman? Mayor, I'll move to adopt a resolution directing summary publication of the ordinance that I just stated. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member D'Alessandro for summary publication on item 4.1. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you very much. And um, be interested to see how this works out. It's, uh, and and, and I, I, again, I take heart in the fact that it is done. It, we aren't plowing new ground here, it is done elsewhere as well. But uh, be interested to see how this all works out, and especially for the folks who will benefit from this here in the city. Thank you. 
We are going to move on to item five of our agenda, our organizational business this evening. First organizational business piece that we're going to talk about is item 5.1. It's a resolution initiating rezoning of Lindale Avenue properties from B2 to B4. Mr. Ramler Olson from our planning agency is here. Good evening and welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the City Council, share my screen. I have a presentation prepared. All right, perfect. Yeah, uh, this is a study item uh, examining a proposal to rezone a total of 28 parcels near Lindale Avenue. Sorry, I gotta move something really quickly. New Lindale Avenue intersections with 86th Street and West 98th Street from B2 to B4, as you said. And uh, part of this is a consideration of a resolution to initiate those proposed rezonings. I've included a couple notes under that bullet point. Um, they're pretty important. Uh, these, this resolution does not obligate the city to rezone the parcels under consideration. So shouldn't feel any pressure to do that. It just um, starts the public hearing process to consider the proposed rezonings. So I think it's necessary to point that out. And those parcels under consideration are on this slide. They're split up uh, by the intersections with 86th Street and 98th Street um, in Lindale Avenue. Um, they're um, reflective of the of the parcels that were within the node areas of the Lindale um, Avenue sur uh, suburban retrofit plan. If you recall from, that was adopted in uh, April of 2021. Um, some guiding principles from that plan were to create a critical mass of housing. And that's what this proposal will allow to happen because of uh, moving from B2 to B4 will actually allow housing within those parcels that are currently zoned B2. Um, it also, yeah, so uh, B4 will support that mixed use character um, and uh, the walkable urban design that's uh, envisioned in the suburban, uh, or within the retrofit plan, let's refer to it as that. Um, so the other initiatives that the city is engaged in that also support this rezoning effort are the 98th Street Station Area Plan and Comp Plan. Um, both of them see mixed uses and uh, again, a critical mass of housing along Lindale Avenue. There were already eight par parcels rezoned um, after the 98th Street Station, or in furtherance of the 98th Street Station Area Plan. That occurred in uh, 2019, I believe. And those eight parcels are viewed in that image on the right. Uh, there's three land uses to be considered within the, the area into consideration, general business, community, commercial, public. Um, that public uh, land use is within the uh, study area or the area under consideration. If you look on the image of the right in the south west corner, um, there's a there's a lot that's guided public that's currently a uh, park and ride lot, um, but it's owned and operated by Metro Transit and they've considered those parcels, uh, including the two to the north uh, for mixed use development. So if this, um, if they do consider uh, redeveloping uh, in, along those uh, along those lines, uh, the city may want to consider actually reguiding that parcel from public to something more appropriate for uh, mixed use to, or yeah for the mixed use development. Um, this is the current zoning uh, of the parcels under consideration. Again, they are B two, so it's no shock there from these images. But it shows you the surrounding zonings uh, at both intersections. Uh, something to consider. Uh, it's more industrial um, uh, near 86 in Lindale, but recently uh, there were um, a, a string of properties. You, you'll see it on uh, the 86th Street node image that were rezoned to transitional industrial. A uh, feature of that new zoning district is that it also allows uh, uh, residential development. So again, kind of in line with that earlier initiative. So right now it's general commercial or B2. Um, something distinct about this zoning district is that it does allow audio auto oriented uses and rezoning to B4 is something that would um, change that character um, by um, 
creating a um, a neighborhood uh, scale a commercial and residential area with mixed uses, more amenable to uh, walkable urban design. That's uh, again within the retrofit plan. And you'll see some of the goals from that zoning district at the bottom, but I think that's also summarized in the staff report. Here's a table comparing the standards from B2 to B4. I've just highlighted a few um, that really do um, uh, put a, a pin on the, the distinction. Um, there's a higher FAR with residential in B4. So again, it can build taller, build more dense. Um, the parking placement is not, is not allowed in the front. So it's not allowed to front between the building and uh, the road. So it's um, allowed on the side or rear uh, window requirements along the uh, the street so again contributing to that walkable environment and um, it actually has a maximum uh, front yard setback but uh, and has a minimum 10 foot so again bringing the building closer to the sidewalk and in furtherance of a more walkable environment something that's always a consideration when you're rezoning is the conformity status of the parcels under consideration um, some lots would be uh, become non-conforming due to characteristics, a lot, a lot of characteristics, um, sorry, uh, due to use, lot characteristics, uh, and or building design. Um, non-conformity created on a lot when it does not meet the standards of the underlying zoning. Uh, so that's when it's created is when it's been approved. Uh, um, and, but there is a distinction. There, is, there are legal non-conformities. And they've received all the uh, required approvals. Um, they can com continue through the various means as stated in that bullet point. And that status runs with the land, so it doesn't, it's not attached to the body, uh, the property owner. It runs with the land. So if the property were to be rezoned um, and it was a legal non conforming land, uh, piece of property, it would continue as such after the rezoning. So they could continue that use in the manner as it was when that rezoning occurred. This is a, a visual display of the lots that are currently conforming in those uh, by use, which have a conforming uses or non-conforming uses. So there's four properties near 86th and Lindale, and there's one um, within the area of 98th and Lindale. Staff has done some engagement with the uh, property owners, uh, under. Um, owners of the properties under consideration. Um, we've set up a Let's Talk Bloomington page to just house uh, materials to be a repository and also to um, take feedback and, and engage with uh, residents through that, through that venue. Um, in early May, we sent out letters um, to owners informing, of them, informing them that we were kicking off this project. Um, on mail and then that were we were also preparing them that we were going to visit the properties to talk to property owners if they were present on May 11th which we did we visited each property on that day um, May 23rd we held a virtual open house sad to say not too many people attended that's that was uh, kind of a bummer but um, nonetheless we held another in person uh, open house an in person one on May 24th the following day only three people attended. Nonetheless, we were advertising these. That was part of the mailers that we sent out. So um, it, uh, for, for, for whatever reason, it just wasn't uh, well attended. But nonetheless, um, we did receive some emails uh, from folks that own property within the areas of, under consideration, but there was no explicit support or opposition. It was just questions about the project uh, generally. So answered those promptly. We held a study session at a planning commission meeting on uh, June 22nd. We received some general support for considering the rezonings, for considering, not necessarily um, a, a stamp of approval on the rezonings. Um, but we also received some questions related to nonconformity, um, the low response rate from owners of properties under consideration. Um, we were asked about what are the plans for Lindale and um, you know, the restriping or rebuilding of Lindale and how that relates to these uh, rezoning projects that we've been carrying out uh, for the in service of the retrofit plan. Um, staff, uh, we, we noted that there was a strong interest in a corridor study from planning commission members and staff agrees with that. We 
we have a, a working group that meets regularly to discuss the retrofit plan and to check in on the progress and to see what our next steps are. And um, there's also, you know, it's worth considering that there is a considerable presence of brownfields within the area. So that would also be part of the corridor study. So it wouldn't be just limited to right of way. Maybe uh, we would also consider those brownfield areas off of the right of way. Next steps, um, if, if all goes well and uh, a resolution to initiate the rezoning is adopted, um, we would um, schedule a public hearing for the Public uh, Planning Commission on August 17th, uh, public hearing with City Council on September 11th. And if you are comfortable with adopting the resolution, there's recommended language on this slide for you to consider. And with that, I can take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Ramler Olson. Uh, why don't you back up the the one to the to the resolution? Because I, I, the point that I, the point that I was going to make was yep. that this is not, in fact, as you stated, this is not the final be all and end all on this project. This is simply initiating the rezoning. And you're a couple of slides back. The the planning commission would look at this. We'd have a public hearing here in front of the city council. I'm sure there would be a lot more engagement hopefully more robustly attended. Um, but with the, there's going to be, this is not the be all and end all. This is just a, the first step in moving this forward as we consider all of this. It, correct, Mayor. Um, really, this is to get your feedback on the proposal. Uh, is there something that staff should consider? Is there anything that we should change our approach? We really want that feedback, but also to consider the resolution for good. Thank you. Zoning. Council? Questions, feedback, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I do, I, I have, it's probably a question um, others up here know the answer to. I just want to make sure that I understand. Um, the intent of this in part, as you mentioned, was to make sure that we could accommodate some residential where we can't today, correct? Um, it says in the definition here um, of what a uh, residential is, is that there there's this accessory notion and that there's this, I'm getting minimum non-residential point zero point one FAR required. I don't know what that means. And so can you do like, is that for like every 10,000 square feet, there needs to be a thousand square feet of residential or something like that? Like what, can you translate that for me? Oh, look at you. You can. <laughs> Great. Uh, Mayor, uh, council member D'Alessandro, is this what you were referring to? These, these standards? Um, I was looking in the council packet. And so in the council packet, it was, Maybe it was a little bit more generic. I was, um, there's a table in here that basically says table two comparison of uses. Um, and under residential, it says in the B2 general commercial, no. And in the B4 neighborhood commercial, it says accessory. And then in parentheses, it says minimum non residential of 0 0.1 FA required, FAR required on site and prints. And I just didn't understand what that definition meant. Oh, um, Mayor, Council Member. Uh I believe that just means that there has to be, it can't just be purely residential. There has to be a non-residential component to it. In order is that to 0.1 mean something like 1%, 10% or something? Or is it just like, how do you, cons how do you all calculate what qualifies as, yep, it's right for B4? Uh, council member, the, so as, as an FAR standard, um, so 0 0.01 of, uh, FAR, uh, I mean, I guess it would just fall within that definition of calculating FAR, floor, floor area ratio yep. of the, the total floor area of the non-residential compared to the lot size. And so that just has to equal 0 0.01 right. minimum in order to have that, uh, to satisfy the mixed use. Right. Okay. That's fair. Report. Yeah. So, so if I have 10, if I have a thousand square feet, at least a hundred feet of that or 10% or 0 0.1 of that floor area ratio needs to be residential or needs to be commercial. Yes, Give I, or take. I mean, I'm trying to use really easy math. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, no I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, council member. Uh, yeah, I believe that's the case. Glenn? I have that right. I, I need Glenn's. Yeah, sure, sure. The ratio <laughs> we're looking for sure. is 10% or greater is, I guess, what I'm asking. Yes. Mr. Marker, go ahead. Mayor Bussey, council member D'Alessandro, that's exactly correct. Okay. 100,000 square foot lot, a minimum of 10,000 square feet would need to be non-residential. You can have pure uh, residential, but you'd have to do that under another zoning district. So Lindale Flats is an example of that on Lindale. Non-residential, does, does that include 
amenities that are provided for the residents that are not considered homes, like like um, you know gyms or pools or something like that. Yeah, uh, Mayor Busey, Council Member D'Alessandro, we have not counted that as non-residential. Okay. Uh, that's customarily incidental to residential. So we would count your like rental office and a gym and a, you know a swimming pool if there was one. We would count that as residential. Okay, so the the term accessory in this definition doesn't imply that it's those accessory you know um, amenities, if you will, that would count towards it. In addition to all of that, ten percent or more, point point one or more of floor area ratio needs to be set aside for some commercial use. Correct. Okay, great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Councilmember Loman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to start off by just saying how much I appreciate uh, that we're taking steps to move forward on this. You know, I look at uh, the idea of renewal, and I'm, I'm a, definitely a supporter of that as we look at uh, what we're trying to do in our city. You know, I look, you know, to our north, Richfield and Edina, and I, I just see all of those <laughs> things being done, and I, I, I get envious uh, sometimes, and it's great to see now we're doing it. And uh, uh, so I think the only question I really have, you know, as I, as I look at this, um, uh, and I, as we kind of look forward, we've got the B2 and we've got the B4, and I know we've done some um, – shifting and changing with what that B4 has meant, um, and it's been around for a little while. But I, I sort of wonder, as we as we look at this area, is B4 really what we want, and does that really keep with the the vision of what we're trying to accomplish there in that, in that area? And that's kind of the, the question I have. You know, is, you know, is there, is there some other zoning district that we ought, ought not use uh, for this? Should we you know, develop a new one. I know we did that in the South Loop uh, to try to make sure that we are crafting and creating exactly what we want there. And just just for example, um, uh, you know, we look at the far uh, piece here. I I, I wonder, um, you know, is that really what we want to do um, with with you know with respect to this that area as you're walking down Lindale and I'm not really looking for an answer you know for that but I think I just want to open that up as we um, as we're looking to craft this you know we're crafting this for a generation um, you know certainly I saw what it was like when I walked up and down Lindale myself but I just want to just I know we have that vision there you know is this really what we want to do with that and that's kind of the question I kind of have is that the right zoning district are we are we restricting ourselves because it's you know what we've got now, or is there something else that would 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 create that um, that wow factor as you walk down Lindale? And is this is this B four? Is that really it? So, uh, but I'll leave it at that. So, thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, two quick items here. Uh, so, one, I support being proactive about this. To Councilmember Lowman's point. Is there at all any possibility that the recommendation, when we actually finally consider it, would come back as something other than B4 um, as you go through the whole study process and find something that maybe is a better fit and or changes to standards in B4 that would be maybe a better fit here? Something like is that a, a just is that a possibility? Or are we locking ourselves into only looking at B4 as it's defined today? Yeah. Uh, Mayor Bussey, Council Member Nelson, the way the resolution is worded, it would lock in the B4 district as at least coming forward to public hearing. Uh, in response to Council Member Lohman's comment, we do think B4 is really well suited in this case. Uh, we're not hesitant at all of creating new districts, and we've been actually criticized for creating too many districts. But in this case, we think B4 is a pretty good match. Uh, for that Lindale retrofit vision insofar as it allows the residential uses, allows a much higher intensity uh, than the B2 district, and then requires the buildings to be uh, close to the street, parking to the side and rear, and then the use uh, mix is a little bit different, um, specifically not allowing uh, auto repair, not allowing gas stations uh, as part of the B4 district. So uh, we do think uh, B4 is a good fit in this case. Uh, um, second item, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I understand the idea about being proactive about this um, because, you know, 
we could wait until somebody brings forth a proposal and rezone it based on that, but they could also bring a proposal that was B2 and not what we're looking for exactly. Um, so I understand the, the, the rationale for the proactive part of it. My question is, um, what happens between now and a potential rezoning? Could somebody bring forth a major expansion, rebuild, or something that is compliant with B2 and would we have flexibility to say, hey, we've already initiated this process. That's not the direction that we're saying that we want to go with this area. Would we have discretion, I guess, as a council? Uh, a mayor, uh, council member Nelson, if someone were to propose something that was in line with the current zoning district without the rezoning having been approved, uh, we would have to evaluate that proposal under the current uh standards so the current zoning so if they were able to get all approvals before the rezoning was approved to be for then that's that that development would be compliant if then it were to be rezoned to be for it would be legally non-conforming at that point in which case there would be they would be allowed to continue um, in the same manner but there would be some restrictions on expansion and other other uh, factors related to their you know how they're using their property but if yeah they were to do something if they received all the approvals before the uh, the rezoning was approved then that would be that would be in line with the code okay. thank you council member carter uh, thank you mayor um so just a couple questions and comments so you mentioned a corridor study and i totally agree with you um i feel like when we think about the vision of the Lindell Avenue uh, retrofit um, initiative and what was laid out in the plan, I mean, I feel like it's a critical piece. Um, and without that, um, I don't feel like we'll ever kind of get the feel that we want in that in that uh, that area. Um, I also am excited to see this in front of us tonight. When I went back and looked at the study uh, when I was re reviewing the packet, I mean, one of the primary recommendations was proactively rezoning um, to help facilitate uh, the vision for the corridor. And so, again, really excited to see this this um, uh, here today. I do have a question kind of related to the Lindell Avenue retrofit study itself and the recommendations laid out because we don't really talk about it much. We don't really kind of get updates on the progress that's being made on all of the recommendations that were laid out and I feel like this is one critical piece of kind of a almost like a bigger work plan that could be in place and so I'm just curious um, I know you said that there is a work group that is meeting and mm -hmm. talking about these things but are there other things that are going to be coming in front of the council or um, are there things that we should be considering moving forward with to help support staff in you know moving this vision forward uh, mayor council member Carter the this rezoning is uh, the last rezoning as recommended in the retrofit plan, so we should celebrate that. And then it moves into looking at the specifics of the corridor. That's where the corridor study becomes operative, is getting uh, a little bit more detailed. There's a lot of visuals and a lot of um, expressions of the character along the along Lindale Avenue within uh, uh, the retrofit plan and so the course door study would just further defined further define those um, those specifics that would enable that that transformation to that that vision um, so that that would probably be something that would come before um, council just to you know, get feedback and uh, to have to uh, start that discussion um, but there's nothing in plan for this year. Um, I, uh, I, I'll defer to the planning manager on the work plan for next year. So maybe I'll just leave him. Yeah, uh, Mayor Boise, Council Member Carter, that's correct. We don't have the corridor plan on this year's uh, work plan. We need to work closely with Public Works on that, but uh, 2024 is definitely a possibility that we can discuss. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that, um, especially um, specific to the corridor. But like when I look at the plan, there are things like a retail strategy, right? Um, so organizing business meetings, creating a strategic business plan for the corridor, evaluating potential for 
a special service district. I mean, there's like all kinds of ideas in here right? or recommendations. And I guess I, and I know that go, it goes beyond planning, I'm guessing. And so maybe it's a question for the city manager, just in terms of, you know, as we think about the long-term plan to execute on this, um, on the study. I mean, how, how are we, how is that planning happening? Like who is um, making sure that those conversations are happening and that we're tracking toward, or maybe we're going to make decisions that we don't want to do some of these things, but yes, yeah, so what does that look like? Yeah. And maybe that's a conversation for another day, but. Um, I think it's a good input, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Carter, into how we are moving forward. Our planning activity is hand in glove or needs to be hand in glove with the work that the HRA and the Port Authority are doing. And so uh, the Port Authority uh, team is actually working on an RFP that will be going out. I think you probably are aware of that, that is uh, going to be looking at some help in terms of framing um, our strategic planning moving forward. And uh, now that the port is expanding beyond the South Loop area, so the process of attracting investment and developers and, and interest in redevelopment um, is going to build on the work that the, the planning team and the council has already done uh, to prepare this. So uh, as you said, this is a long-term plan, uh, and it's going to require the, the collaboration of uh, multiple units here to move it forward. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Yeah, thank you. I apologize. I know that I'm always iterative about my questions, but that's because the other council members bring things up that trigger things for me. So I appreciate your patience. Um, <clears throat> kind of dovetailing into Councilmember Carter's thoughts there. You know, one of the things when I was looking at the the zone, generally speaking, and thinking about the retrofit plan was, you know, we 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 definitely heard from from residents about things like um, the uh, the boulevard itself, the you know the the road and traffic management around that we t we heard about you know having places of public gathering and social opportunities and you know in our in our zoning we don't generally set aside as far as i can tell requirements around that and i'm I, what I mean, for example, is um, I've been in certain cities where um, as part of a development process or anything, um, you know, 10 percent of the available like land use needs to be set aside. I think we do that for like landscaping, but like some people do it for public art or other things like that. I'm just as we think about that, that, you know, does there need to be more added to the zone or can that be done in these opportunity zones we've talked about that kind of are overlays on on the you know the basic zoning framework. So I don't know the right answer to that, but I would I would like to get a p point of view on that to say the zone is like layer so comprehensive plan then zone and then we do other things on top of that or do we have to go down into the zone uh, itself in order to make some of those accommodations. I don't know the answer but I thought maybe I'd throw that out there as if there does need to be some flexibility in, in the definitions around B4 to accommodate that as opposed to doing it in some layer higher related to the Lindell retrofit plan, for example. Yeah. Mayor Bussey, Council Member D'Alessandro, I like the way you describe that as kind of layers of activity. Uh, you can think of the zoning district as setting the table and then subsequent to that as a development proposal comes in, uh, we might have a park uh, as part of that property that shows up on our uh, Lindale retrofit plan as a aspiration when that development comes in. At that time, we may look for dedication of that park, or in this case, uh, you know, a small parklet. Um, so that's one example. Another example is when the port HRA are working with developers, talking about public assistance. They have a high level of influence over the design of the end product. Uh, that's another point at which a lot of those ideas are layered on on top of the zoning. Well, I guess that would be true for sustainability requirements as well then. Um, if, if we wanted to layer in those, and I'm making, you know, I'm making things up not to be, but if we said, you know, it because of where it's located, it needs to be certain types of materials or it needs, I mean, do those things fall into that category as well as opposed to at the zone, zoning layer, if you will? Yeah, uh, Mayor Bussey, Council Member D'Alessandro, that's correct. Um, right now under Minnesota state law, cities are very constrained in what they can do in terms of requiring sustainability, but when there's public money 
involved, then then that changes the whole discussion. All right. One last question is: I, as I look at this slide that you have here, uh, as you uh, down near the bottom, the rear and the side setbacks, you've got uh, there's a certain setback or different setbacks for buildings over four stories, which brings to mind the question: Is there a height limit in the the B four district? Yes, uh, Mayor, Mayor Bussey, our height limits are independent of our zoning districts in Bloomington. We have a height limits map, um, which varies by, you know, geographically, um, but it doesn't match up one-to-one -one with zoning districts. So uh, thinking about uh, Lindale Avenue, uh, 98th and Lindale, and that surrounding area is a much higher height limit um, than as you move north. But generally, it's four stories further north. I believe it's eight stories in the uh, 98th and Lindale area. And then uh, through various uh, zoning provisions, you can get height bonuses on top of that. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, Council, this was, uh, as we said, this was basically to initiate the rezoning. And if uh, uh, I think we've asked a number of questions, I think, to kind of give staff the idea of if we did go forward with this, things we would like to see or perhaps considerations we'd like to work forward as we worked through this uh, conversation. Um, but with that in mind, uh, additional conversation or if nothing else, I'd look for action on item 5.1. I'm happy to make that motion. If Council Member D'Alessandro. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. So I'll move to uh, adopt a resolution initiating rezoning of the parcels included in the project study area per the recommendations of the Lindale Avenue Suburban Retrofit plan second motion by council member d'alessandro second by council member carter to adopt this resolution initiating rezoning of the parcels included <laughs> in the project study area per the recommendations of the lindale avenue suburban retrofit plan no further council discussion on this hearing none all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye opposed motion carries six zero thank you very much gentlemen you're off and running very good thank you as mentioned earlier as we uh, adopted our agenda this evening, item 5.2 has been withdrawn, so we will not be addressing item 5.2. That'll take us right into item 5.3, our council policy and issue update. And uh, I will kick us off summarizing our city council listening session that we held at 5.45. Actually, we only had one speaker this evening. And the speaker brought up a, a good question regarding the keeping of chickens and other possible winged fowl in the backyard. And questions initially about the size and the regulations of enclosures and so on, which I think staff is going to take a look at. And then the possibility of adding uh, other poultry, such as ducks and pigeons, to our definition of what can be kept in the backyard. And I think uh, the, the consensus of the council was this is, uh, we, we want to answer the questions, that the specific questions she had regarding enclosures, uh, but then the possibility of having that discussion of additional poultry, ducks and pigeons, and possibly more depending on how we, far we want to take this conversation. So that was our that was our council listening session today. And I will note once again, it was a resident who we have not met before. So once again, uh, our council listening session has given us an opportunity to meet someone else and somebody new in the community and to talk about something brand new, our, our web foot friends. So that was our council listening session. Mr. Verbrugge, do you have anything to add this evening? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. I do have one item that... Um, we are looking for an individual or individuals who would be interested in serving on the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District. We're going to have an action uh, for the council on the 24th agenda. If we can find uh, someone or several who would be willing to step forward to serve in that capacity and then making a recommendation to Hennepin County on the appointment of that person uh, for the Bloomington seat as it were so i will send to you all uh, a map of the area and if you have uh, constituents that you're familiar with who either have an interest in watershed district policy or activities or a background in hydrology or other sort of environmental science those are the exact kind of candidates that we're looking for so i'll share that with you all tomorrow thank you thank you mr verbrugge council anything to add this evening Councilmember D'Alessandro, Councilmember Nelson, Councilmember Mua, Councilmember D'Alessandro. I think I get the benefit of being in your direct line of sight when you ask that question. So if, if somebody else would like to go first, that's completely fine. Oh, I 
Okay. I had three I had three items. Hopefully they don't take long. Um, one of the things I noted today um, when we talked about um, Bloomington Forward is that um, we are speaking to the potential, um, you know, Bloomington resident versus a non-Bloomington resident uh, split in our revenues. Uh, we've downgraded that from the 75% we talked about a couple of years ago to 60% now. Has the Minnesota Extension provided that updated documentation in support of that? And if so, would you mind getting it f for us? I think that'd be great. Um, I've been c interested in that, knowing that we had kind of pre-pandemic numbers, and now we probably have some numbers, hopefully, that include you know impacts to pandemic uh, of the pandemic on things like um, sales tax that we'll pay because we're having Amazon ship stuff to our house, for example, or other things of that nature. So um, just wanted to ask that question. Uh, Mr. Right. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, we had expected to be able to have that information by now. What we've learned is that the Department of Revenue, which produces the sales tax data, is strained, and so they have yet to uh, provide the information um, that usually comes out about this time of year, usually a little bit earlier. And it's only when that information is available that the University of Minnesota Extension Service can then analyze the data. And so we're waiting for revenue to uh, get the sales tax data pulled together. And um, we're in contact with the Extension Service so they know that they'll be ready to go, but it'll take them a couple of weeks to run that data. Uh, we hope to have that as soon as possible. Uh, and just to recap what Councilmember D'Alessandro is uh, speaking about, um, the, the sales tax that is generated in uh, Bloomington, according to the 2019 Extension Service Analysis of Department of Revenue data, was at somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of sales taxes paid by non-Bloomington residents. In 2020, uh, because of the pandemic, or 2021, I think our most recent data was, that that number dropped to 60 percent. And, and I think that our understanding of that is largely related to uh, the fact that hospitality was largely shut down during the pandemic. So all the outside spending on hotels and restaurants and other things that generate sales tax um, was not occurring. And so uh, I can't say what that number is going to be. I can't expect a, a certain number. Um, I have a feeling it will be closer to what we saw pre-pandemic than what we saw during the pandemic. Yeah. And as soon as we have that available, we will add it to the Bloomington Forward page so people understand it. And then we'll be able to provide a comparison about um, you know, what happens if you fund these projects in one manner and what happens if you fund them in another manner that is mostly dependent on Bloomington taxpayers. So that information will be available. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was just in relation to kind of the Lindell retrofit, I've gotten two complaints uh, recently about um, – lighting from our good friends and storage facilities. Um, I know we grandfathered them. We made some positive changes to our lighting code not that long ago, and we grandfathered these uh, storage facilities into that, you know, as a result of that. Um, I don't know if we can think about that differently, but I worry as we continue to add, for example, if we add more residential on the Lindell Avenue retrofit, Right um, now, it's not just the patrons of Luna de Luna that have to look at this like ridiculously lit up storage facility with nothing going on at 10 o'clock at night. Now it's a bunch of residential units as well, potentially. So I don't know how to do that, but I, it's I think it's important. Um, it's on Penn Avenue as well as Lindell Avenue. We have these challenges, and so um, I, I'm not 100% sure if we can do something there. But if we could, that would be great. And so I'd love to just have. Um, some conversation about that as it relates to all the other work that we're doing. Um, and then lastly, one of the things I thought about was um, as we talk about our strategic uh, communications, I've noticed that uh, we don't get as much, potentially as much imp uh, interaction on Let's Talk Bloomington as we might could. And um, that's not probably well-formed grammar, but you knew what I meant. Um, and I'm wondering if it's because we don't leave those things up long enough and so, or, so that when by the time that people see them in the briefing or whatever, then they're close. Closed and then they're like, ah, I didn't get to that for two weeks, but now it's gone. Um, I, so, I say that because, you know, as we think about the chicken question, that's a great example of like something you could put up there and have a, a long, a, like a longer term study, right? Where people are giving us comments on it because it's something we might consider. So I don't know if that's part of our strategic communications plan, but I wanted to throw that out there. And then that's it for me. 
Very good. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just two quick items here. Um, is there any update on 35W southbound closure? It was my understanding that was supposed to happen this weekend and did not. So was it rescheduled oh, it or did. was it did? It was closed. Oh, it was just north of me. All right. Because I got to work. So <laughs> and I was surprised. I, I thought it was going 169. So. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, sorry for bringing it up then. It was the weekend closure, wasn't it? Wasn't it was a weekend closure, but it wasn't all the way down to 35, which is what I was expecting. That's right. Okay, it so was, they must just be doing that in phases as they go. Okay. To okay. Um, and then I just want to follow up on one thing that the mayor had brought up earlier about um, looking at all the fees and structures, and I had brought up somewhat tangentially about building an inspection. And just one note, um, although I completely agree with the thoughts of the mayor, I, I think that we may be preempted by state law in that area that requires it to be value-based permits to be based on valuation of the project. Um, so we would, if that was something of interest, I think we would have to work with our state partners on changing legislation there is, is my understanding. So thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Remember. It's not the only fee. It's just, gotcha. just bringing that one up that there is yep. um, state law there. Council member move up. Thank you, mayor. Um, we've had a lot of conversations regarding building a community where people are welcome and where they want to be. And that's really caused me to really notice small details around town. And so tonight I, I'd like to get some support <clears throat> from council um, specifically around covered bus stations on Civic Plaza property. Because uh, I, when I look at that, the message it is sending is that we welcome you if you have business here, if you drive a car, or we welcome you if you have a bike. But if you have to take public transit, we're not going to shelter you when you come here. And we live in Minnesota where it rains and it snows and it sleets. And so having covered bus stations, bus stops on Civic Plaza would send that message that we welcome you no matter how you get here. And we're going to cover you and shelter you for the business that you need. And so I would um, like to find support to be able to do that and put that on our property so that we can send that message that Bloomington is the welcoming place where you can be and that you're welcome. Thank you, Council Member. And, and I would agree with you. Uh, it, it, it makes logical sense. Yeah, if you want to welcome people, give them a, a place they can get out of the, the uh, elements. I would have to ask anyone who might know, uh, I know shelters are a metro transit thing, and uh, I know they take input. And if, if I you know, if I wanted to do air quotes with my fingers, I would. They take input on that kind of thing, but not. Um, it, it's not a guarantee if you request a covered shelter that you're going to get a covered shelter. Is it, Mr. Keel? Uh, you're absolutely correct that, generally speaking, the majority of transit stops are... Uh, owned and managed by Metro Transit. Um, and they only have covered stations at very, very high use uh, locations. So I think we are well, well beyond, below the, the threshold of actual traffic that they would actually invest in a covered station. That's not to say that the city couldn't build it themselves. The, frankly, most of the covered bus stations in the Metro area are not owned by Metro Transit. It is uh, joining properties that have built those on their own. So we could certainly investigate, maybe get some data on how many people are using these transit stops, maybe some very rough estimates about what the cost might be or the range of costs associated with these things and share that with the council. We'd be, we could certainly do that. I, I don't know. I'd give that a thumbs up, at least to, to learn more information on this. I think yeah. it certainly couldn't hurt. Got enough nodding heads. That's the only thing I would add is uh, I'm pessimistic about the data we would have. We don't have the offering now, so that could be detriment to the data that we would get from Metro Transit on who actually uses it. But if we build it, you know, will they come? We'll know. <laughs> Good question as well. Thank you. Council, anything else tonight? Seeing nothing else, our agenda is complete. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to adjourn this evening. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed motion carries 6-0. Thank you all for the discussion this evening. Thanks to staff for your work. Thanks to everybody who participated or tuned in this evening. Have a great rest of your week, everybody.